because the participant to the dark habitat would like to hang their poster, please.
Okay, colleague, can you have a seat, please? So we are starting the third Mediterranean Symposium on the conservation of dark habitat. And uh, without further delay, I will give the floor to Mr. Khalil Atiyah to open the symposium. Thank you, Atif. I, I don't want to be too heavy for, uh, to you and to, to uh, repeat always uh, things that I have uh, already said. Uh, so I will be very brief. I think that uh, this uh, second second edition of uh, the symposium, a uh, third, yes, okay. Uh, the third edition of uh, the uh, symposium on uh, dark habitats, on marine canyons and caves uh, has been uh, well prepared and uh, the uh, material will be uh, very uh, interesting and fruitful, as well as uh, the uh, discussions. So uh, I hope that uh, we all take advantage of uh, this uh, session and uh, learn a little bit more and prepare some, uh, uh, some uh, future uh, uh, um, activities in order to uh, share it and to uh, push the works on dark habitats forward. So I uh, declare this uh, third edition open. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the first session uh, on the state of knowledge and it is sh shared by Maya Ford. And the reporter is Mahdi Aisi. So the floor is yours, Maya. So hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you had some time to eat something. Um, so we're starting with this first session on the state of knowledge of dark habitats. Uh, we will be um, addressing cave and deep sea ecosystems and species. And we start with a keynote conference by Marcia Bo, um, the Ligurian White Coral Province, new supporting evidence. Marcia, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Maya, for this introduction. Uh, thank you very much to the Dark Habitat Committee for the invitation and to the entire organizing team. I, uh, for me, it's a great honor to start this third symposium on the conservation of uh, Mediterranean dark habitats. And uh, I am very pleased to see in the audience here in Genova, many colleagues, many friends. Uh, before going into more detail about uh, the topic of my discussion today regarding some recent uh, uh, explorations in the deep Ligurian Sea, I would like to make a brief uh, overview of the state of the art of Mediterranean dark habitats. Well, there are uh, several parameters that could be used uh, to evaluate uh, the current status uh, regarding the identification and characterization of uh, Mediterranean dark habitats. However, in this uh, specific occasion, I would like to refer to the lists developed by UNEP, RACSPA, regarding Mediterranean uh, dark habitats, because they provide a uh, clear, comparable information over time. Uh, so if we consider only the reference uh, patches uh, of the dark habitats as a whole, uh, comprehensive of uh, cave environments, as well as mesophotic and more strictly uh, deep uh, aphotic habitats, uh, then we see an impressive, extraordinary increase 
uh, in the last few years of the number of reference fatches, uh, going from 20 in 2015 to 100 in the latest version uh, just published uh, of 2019. Uh, undoubtedly, this is due to a massive uh, revision process that has been carried out in the recent years, uh, by, uh, which has integrated an ever increasing amount of scientific papers, books and technical reports uh, from a growing number of working teams all over the Mediterranean Sea dedicating to the dark habitats. Uh, without doubt, uh, that dark habitats uh, has attracted a growing attention, scientific uh, and not only scientific attention worldwide, not just in the Mediterranean Sea. And partly this is due to an increasing availability of um, technical means of investigations, uh, uh, which allow us to explore map, characterize, and monitor uh, these incredible habitats. Um, indeed, this is a very fortunate time, at least uh, from the technical point of view, to study dark habitats. Um, uh, the 2019 version of uh, uh, the Habitat Manual not only widened uh, um, and, um, the number and uh, diversified the number of habitat uh, uh, listed as dark habitats, but also um, <clears throat> shook a little bit uh, the traditional zonation system of the Mediterranean Sea by including new zones particularly the offshore Circa Littoral, which is comprehensive now of all those habitats uh, characteristics of the shelf break, as well as a more detailed zonation of the aphotic systems, uh, including the upper and lower batial, as well as the abyssal zone. Uh, this was made in order to uh, give a better representation of the bathymetrical distribution of the uh, known and new habitats, uh, uh, both on hard and soft bottoms, uh, mm, with regards to the current uh, scientific literature, to the current knowledge. Uh, for each reference habitat, uh, we have an informative sheet uh, which uh, includes the most updated data regarding uh, each habitat, in particular information such as the environmental characteristics representative of this habitat, its geographic distribution, the typical species, its conservation interest, vulnerability levels, as well as all the protection measures in place. However, with respect to the previous versions of the manual, there are two additional aspects which reflects a bit the more modern management aspects attitude towards habitats, marine habitats in general. And in particular, uh, a definition of the ecosystem services provided for each habitat, as well as the effective or potential monitoring protocols in place. These latter based on scientific literature, as well as the recently published action plan for dark habitats. <clears throat> so, well, uh, it is desirable in the near future to continue to pursue this collection of information regarding the taxonomy, ecology and biology of the species uh, involved in this uh, um, uh, habitats, as well as to continue to gather information regarding the functioning of uh, the um, uh, dark uh, uh, ecosystems. Um, um, besides this uh, activity, uh, obviously, we need to accompany this uh, um, topic also to a large scale uh, and shared monitoring operation, which will help us to identify and better understand changes over time. Uh, this uh, also thanks to the development and implementation of uh, ecological uh, uh, indexes.
this is important also in light of the very ambitious uh, objectives of the 2030 UN agenda regarding the identification, protection and restoration of the most vulnerable uh, sites. Uh, so, um, in this regards, um, uh, obviously the biogenic batial habitats dominated by white coral bioconstruction construction, um, are for sure, uh, nowadays considered among the most uh, studied uh, deep uh, and dark uh, Mediterranean habitats. Um, and um, someone may think that uh, uh, a sufficient number of investigations have been carried out targeting this specific habitat. Um, However, uh, batial bioconstructions are a good example of how much potential is still to be unveiled uh, through deep sea research. For instance, uh, deep coral provinces uh, characterized by this lush growth of white corals are still nowadays identified and studied, um, um, providing us with a better comprehension of the deep sea biodiversity, its origin and its role in the deep sea realm. The Ligurian Sea in particular is a very interesting case because uh, it offers a dual potential, let's say. From one point of view, uh, the seminal work of Lieutenant Nicola Fusco from the Marine Hydrographic Institute back in the late uh, 1960s um, gave us a unique historical perspective uh, for what regard the location of batial bioconstructions in this marine region. Thanks to a wide collection of data uh, from trolling by catch uh, and the pioneeristic surveys in the area, such as the one conducted by the Calypso vessel. Uh, also, the second aspect is that uh, differently from the shallow water environments, uh, which have been heavily investigated in the last decades uh, by means of modern uh, technologies, the batial uh, benthic habitats of the Ligurian Sea, especially hard grounds, are overall poorly known, especially for um, white corals, uh, only a few surveys have been conducted to locate the biogenic bio constructions uh, of Portofino and uh, in the Levante Canyon. Uh, this latter reporting for the first time leaving biogenic habitats in the region. Uh, therefore, a comprehensive survey um, was needed to um, better understand the occurrence of this habitat in this region, uh, its extension and its ecological status uh, in order to fill the knowledge gap for an otherwise very well known biogeographic sector of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this also considering the heavy uh, fishing effort uh, um, um, on the uh, Ligurian Batial grounds. So within the framework of the project Curiosity, we carried out the full exploration of the Fusco's uh, coral areas, historical areas, divided into four sectors. You see them in this map uh, from Genova, Portofino, Deiva Marina and Levante Canyon of Monte Rosso, uh, integrating also past and present bycatch data, as well as uh, uh, trolling vessel tracks. Site scan sonar surveys were used to uh, check if in the historical areas uh, reliefs were present and they have been identified in five of the 10 investigated areas uh, where ROV surveys have then been concentrated. You see them as red spots in this uh, map. <clears throat> so, well, um, uh, despite uh, being uh, at uh, relatively close these areas, 
from 10 to 15 kilometers apart, the coral occurrences were much different, uh, basically reflecting the environmental sec settings of the different areas in terms of uh, uh, depth, slope, and distance from the canyon, as well as in anthropic impact. Um, the first area is a small coral mound, which was detected on the plateau, on the Genova plateau at about 700 meters depth. It is a heavily fragmented rubble of Lophelia pertusa. Uh, and uh, uh, evident signs of trawling's uh, marks are present in the area. Uh, in Portofino, a massive bioherm, uh, about 700,000 years old, stretching for four kilometers between 600 and 1,000 meters depth, is present. Uh, is mainly made of a dead uh, bioconstruction of uh, Lophelia pertusa, up to five meters high, uh, with few leading colonies. Then, in the area of Levante Canyon, we added up to the area previously known and reported by Emanuela Fanelli in 2017, two additional coral mounds about 300 meters long, between 500 and 600 meters depth. Uh, they are in an area of strong currents and subjected to uh, high sedimentation. They are made of living Madrepora oculata colonies. And finally, in Deiva Marina, two very large living reefs of Madrepora oculata were found on the sloping and vertical walls of uh, uh, the Deiva Marina Canyon. This area is less subjected to uh, the trawling impact. Well, clearly, uh, the <clears throat> Uh, Genova coral mound, uh, heavily fragmented, hosts also the lowest uh, diversity levels, while uh, the complex bioconstruction of Deiva Marina, uh, subjected to low silting and strong currents, hosts the highest diversity of megabenthic and demersal species, supporting uh, the high conservation interest for this specific area. Uh, similarly, the Portofino bioherm, uh, despite being uh, uh, sub mainly subfossil, is home to large forests of uh, deep sea gorgonians. Um, these deep sea gorgonians here are secondary habitat formers, reaching high densities and large sizes. Uh, Taxonomic investigations of the collected samples of the collected specimens revealed the presence of uh, um, poorly known species such as uh, Placogorgia coronata, Massiliensis, and Acanthogorgia armata, um, which basically are more common than what originally thought, at least in this region. Uh, the um, easternmost areas uh, uh, of uh, investigated is the one suffering the most from the uh, impact of artisanal and uh, recreational fishing activities. Uh, uh, large quantities of uh, lost gears, mainly long lines, and uh, high percentages of entanglement are reported for the area, especially Deiva Marina, which is here encircled by the red square. Um, <clears throat> the Deva Marina Canyon, moreover, um, funnels large quantities of uh, urban litter, mainly plastic items, at the base of the reefs, uh, supporting high levels of vulnerability of these uh, uh, sites newly discovered. <clears throat> um, we have to say that uh, for sure all the uh, most of the historical uh, coral areas that uh, were originally reporting corals and nowadays show no signs of reliefs are crossed by <clears throat> trawling uh, um, uh, tracks and as you can see from this map they are the gray areas, including also the coral mound of the Genova Plateau. Uh, we, this supports the idea that other coral mounds were present in the area 
but have been swept away and buried in the last few decades of trolling activity. At the same time, we have to um, say that there are some sort of pristine areas, wide batial muddy plains, such as the one shown here in this map, um, <clears throat> which are um, uh, eluded by trolling activities because they are protected from a complex seafloor topography. They have in the vicinity canyons, walls and the reef. <clears throat> and here we found indeed pristine, dense and healthy forest of easy deeds that were thought to be long lost in the region. <clears throat> Therefore, in conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, um, the occurrence of living bioconstructions uh, support the existence of a cold water coral belt along the eastern Ligurian Sea, sustained by high hydrodynamic uh, uh, regime in the Levante Canyon. So far, uh, this area accounts for about nine square kilometers of both living and dead bioherms, uh, and this evidence supports the existence of a distinct Ligurian cold water coral province. Uh, we have to say that uh, it's necessary to uh, couple these uh, large scale uh, characterizations of the uh, bio benthic bio deep benthic biochenosis to uh, large scale monitoring pro um, projects in order to <clears throat> identify the, those areas, the, the most sensitive areas worthy of uh, our uh, protection. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Martia, and uh, really interesting uh, presentation. It's true that um, taking in consideration historical data to uh, define loca locations is uh, really something that we should keep in mind. Yes. So I uh, suppose that there must be some questions. <laughs> Just about. Okay, we have the time only for one question. Far away. <laughs> very much. Hello, Miss uh, Marzia Bo. My name is uh, Tancred Barrault, and I am from uh, Istanbul University. Uh, I would just ask a short uh, question about the uh, record you have taken of the white corals. Uh, did you do the survey with a ROV, a, a remotely operated vehicle? And if yes, which model? Or is it specific design from Genova University? Okay. Uh, um, yes, we actually did the surveys with the ROV. The name of this ROV is MultiPluto. It was designed uh, uh, by uh, an uh, Italian engineer, and uh, it's um, it's an let's say a normal working class ROV, and it's not uh, property of University of Genova. <laughs> Okay, so I'm afraid um, we'll have to wait for later for other questions, but I'm sure Marcia will be at the coffee break. Yes, for sure. So available. <laughs> so uh, we go forward. And uh, so Ricardo will be presenting us distributions of some poorly known Atlanto Mediterranean deep sea species of Anthozoans in the Western Mediterranean. Yes. While uh, Ricardo is installing, I just would like to remind you that there is a very nice uh, exposition on deep sea photos and species. Uh, I think it has been prepared by uh, the colleagues of the University of Genova, and uh, it's really nice. So you should have a look if you haven't yet seen it. Okay, good afternoon. Um, well, uh, I'm going to present just a few uh, the information about a few species that we have found in the Mediterranean, in the deep sea Mediterranean, 
I think that uh, I, as we were yesterday, I will try to, to be provocative with the, with the presentations because uh, when we are talking about uh, bathial and circulatory species, I think that it's very difficult to say that they are endemic, that they are Atlanto-Mediterranean, or if they are coming from, from other places, because uh, in many cases, these species are distributing in areas that we didn't know before. And maybe they had been there forever. And uh, we will see that some of these species that we call now uh, endemic from the Mediterranean, or we call endemic from the Atlantic, very possibly they are distributing in very uh, close areas. And then I will explain some of the species that we have found during the, the last uh, decades that I think that is also changing the way that we are thinking about the, the ecosystem and the benthic habitats. Uh, this link with what yesterday we were discussing about coralligenous, and we were discussing that at the beginning, the description of coralligenous was because of the uh, red corals banks. Now we know that the red corals banks are in more than 1,000 meters, then obviously this is not uh, coralligenous. And sometimes we are using also some specific species uh, to describe coralligenous or other kind of, of habitats, but we will see that uh, really they are playing different roles and they are distributing in, in different areas. I'm going to put these two examples. One is the Paramuricia clavata that normally is considered as an endemic species of the Mediterranean, but we know that there is a species that is distributing also in the Atlantic, in Portugal, in the sea mounds, in the, in the middle of the Atlantic, then is another not endemic species, but Atlanto Mediterranean species. And the same with Calogorgia that was considered in the past like an Atlantic species. And we know that is also in the deep sea in, in the Mediterranean. And something that is interesting is that we had been researching in, in many areas in the Mediterranean during the last uh, two decades. And we have carried out a lot of uh, different expeditions from the Gibraltar Strait to Lebanon and trying to get as much information as possible from the uh, bioengineering species, the habitats that we are finding. And uh, in some cases, we have been taking samples of these uh, species, trying to identify the exact species that is creating the, 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 the habitats. And uh, well, we have found more than 150 species of anthozoans during these uh, researches. And most of them has been already mentioned for the Mediterranean. Then there are no, uh, a lot of discoveries as such, but there are some uh, new species that they were not mentioned in, in the last decades in the, in the Mediterranean. And I think that they is worth to, to, to talk about them. One of them is Nisella granifera. This is a Gorgonian that is more common in, in the African waters, in the Canary Island, in Macaronesia, and Azores, and, and so on. We have found it also in some uh, Northeast Atlantic uh, seamounts, but now, is becoming a, an important uh, uh, Gorgonian in the, in the Mediterranean. And the information is every year uh, more abundant about the presence of, of this uh, um, Gorgonian in the Mediterranean. Another one that we have found recently is the Anthomastus. Anthomastus is a genus that can be found all over the world. But uh, this kind of uh, soft corals, uh, in uh, the, the ones that could be, because we have not been able to take a sample of this species, um, unfortunately, this uh, could be the Anthomastus grandiflora or any one of those species that are close to the, to the Northeast Atlantic uh, area. And as we are going to, to go again with another expedition to the place where this species is, we hope to take the sample and to identify the, the species. But this was another species that was not uh, mentioned in, in the Mediterranean. And we have another one that is a sea pen, this Protoptilum carpenteri. 
this species, we have been working with, with this species in many places in the Atlantic, in Norway, in Denmark, in the UK. This is a species that is uh, very well known in the, in the Mediterranean, but has been recently known from the, from the Mediterranean Sea. And I will explain later what is the, the distribution of, of this species. But so far, it was only known from the North Atlantic. And now we know that it is in the Mediterranean. The other one that is very interesting is Phanopates rigida. It's a black coral. It's a black coral that is known from the Western Atlantic, from the American waters. But now we have it in the Mediterranean. We don't know how this species has reached the, the Mediterranean, but this is another species that is uh, becoming an important uh, bioengineered species in, in the Mediterranean. And another is the Scleractinian Anomocora fecunda, because this is a species that is known from the Atlantic, is known especially from the Macaronesian area between uh, Canary Island, Madeira, Azores, but now we have found it also uh, inside the Mediterranean and is creating this uh, typical uh, also habitat that they, they have in the Mediterranean. Then there are several species that are changing the way that we are thinking about the, the habitats building uh, species in the Mediterranean with the increasing knowledge that we have on deep sea habitats. These are the areas because I'm focusing in the Western Mediterranean in this, uh, in this presentation. But I would say that in the case, for example, of the Protoptilum caperteri, the, the sea pen, uh, there are information about this species in Italian waters. Mastro Totaro uh, et al. already published uh, some information about this species. We have found it even in Malta then it means that it's going deeper inside the, the Mediterranean because many of these new species normally are found around the Alboran Sea. That is the connection with the Atlantic. But some of them are becoming common even inside the, the Mediterranean. We have the, the black coral, the Panopates rigida, that is mainly in sea mounds that are in the middle of the Alboran Sea. And the same with other species like Anomocora and Tomastus. With Nicella granifera, this another Gorgonian that I was explaining, there are more data that is coming. And you will see in the posters that now Nicella granifera has also been found between the Alboran Sea and the Balearic Island, again, uh, around the area of Murcia, where there has been some uh, studies that uh, during the, the recent years has uh, provided with, with new information of, of these species. Then there are many other species that on one side, we don't know exactly which species are, but are in the deep sea. Then they are also creating uh, new, new habitats. We have this one that you have in the center, that is uh, Placogorgia paramuricia. There are some debate about this, this species. And uh, we are expecting to, to have a sample to know exactly the, the species because we don't know. But this is already inside the Mediterranean, creating beautiful forests, sometimes in 500 meters, 600 meters, then it's another species to take into account. We have found other species of Siphonogorgia that we need to identify, that is a soft corals, also that is common in the, in the Atlantic, but not in the Mediterranean. Black corals like Antipatella warastoni can be found now inside the Mediterranean. Yeah, it's crossing the, the Gibraltar Strait. Then it's another species that can be part of the Antipatarians that we have in the Mediterranean. And there are several species. Spinimurisia atlantica is a species that can go quite deep, can go to 900 meters, 1,000 meters. But now we are finding this species mainly in, let's say, shallow waters, if we are talking about our habitats, because normally we are finding this species inside the Mediterranean in uh, 80 meters, 60 meters, 90 meters, but it's becoming uh, more common in, inside the Mediterranean. And there are several species 
that are just on the other side, crossing the Gibraltar Strait, and that very possibly, maybe they are already inside the Mediterranean, we don't know yet, or maybe they will become part of the anthozoans in the Mediterranean, like the Radicipes, Flabellum, Solindros milia, and well, recent discoveries and rediscoveries that we have uh, had in the Mediterranean with soft corals like Nidalia studeri and Chironeftia Mediterranean also prove that we still will have very possibly new species to discover in the deep sea. We don't know. We don't know. We know very little about the, the deep sea. Yes, most of the species that we are finding are the species that has been already described, but there are some others that are new for science or that they were thought to be extinct or maybe disappear from, from the Mediterranean. And some others that were considered only from the Atlantic side. Okay, now we have some species that are already creating habitats, like this is the case of Nicella granifera. We have other species that are becoming part of the cement fields. Now you can find the, the Protoptilum carpenteri together with Penatula, Phosphoria, with Beretilum, with many other species. And in the last expedition that we did last year, we have found more Protoptilum carpenteri in the Alboran Sea. Then it's becoming a more common species in the Mediterranean. And very possibly we misidentified this species because it's similar to Funiculina quadrangularis somehow. And depending on the colors, when it's red, it's very clear, but when it's not red, then sometimes you can confuse the species with some Mediterranean species. And then we have other species that we think that now are becoming vulnerable marine ecosystems inside the, the, the Mediterranean. The question is, have they been here with us always? And is, we only knew about the resistance because we are increasing the, the researches in the deep sea areas. Maybe they have been always here and they are a land to Mediterranean species that has been in the, in the Mediterranean or are they newcomers? We don't know if maybe climate change, maybe the movement of some species can increase the, the amount of species. There is maybe possibly clear for species like Antepatella warastoni the black corals that we know that is from the uh, Atlantic and is now entering into the Mediterranean. And could be the same for some species like Philigorgia guineensis that we know that is also from the uh, African coast and now is becoming more and more common inside the Mediterranean. Really, I think that uh, is, is going to be interesting to increase the, the, the researches inside the Mediterranean because I'm sure that we will find more species and we will find more uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems and habitats that are built by this uh, kind of anthozoans that they were unknown in, in, the, in the last decades. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ricardo, for all this information and positive information. We have new species um, and also for the nice photos that are, um, I mean, very interesting. So now we have a few minutes for some questions. No, no questions. Okay, so I just had a small question. What is your opinion on the fact that these species might have been there before and we hadn't seen them or if they're newcomers or maybe a little bit of both? Mm -hmm. I think that we have both uh, cases. I think that in some species, they seems to be spreading inside the Mediterranean. We have Spinimurisia atlantica mm -hmm. that we are finding these species in more places, even in places that we were researching in the past and they were not there. Uh -huh. Now we are finding that this species is becoming uh, more, more common. Then I guess that this species is spreading in the Mediterranean. Uh, Filigorgia genensis is another species that was known in the past from the, from the Gulf of Guinea. And then 
I guess that this is another way of, of, of expansion that we have found with the sclerotinians, like uh, with the uh, Dendrophilia laborelli. Mm -hmm. But with the species that are in shallow water, it's much easier because if you have not seen it before, yeah. it's very difficult that this species is appearing there and that you can identify the, how they are spreading. But for a species like Nicella granifera, that are in deep areas, or Protoctylum carpenteri that also can live in very deep areas, it's very difficult to know if they are newcomers or they have been there forever. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> So now we will have a communication by Francesco. Um, on substrate related fascias of dendrophilia cornigia. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Francesco Ricchetti. I'm from the University of Genova, and I will uh, present some facts about the different facies created by the yellow coral, Dendrophilia cornigera. Um, marine animal forests uh, represent key habitats in the deep sea, and their conservation is uh, of primary interest. Uh, anyway, our information on the, uh, the, on the ecology of the, spe of the species structuring these habitats is uh, often scarce, even for uh, those species uh, which are generally considered uh, well studied. And this prevents uh, a correct management of these deep sea ecosystems. The case of the yellow coral will uh, exemplify this, uh, this fact. Uh, this, uh, this temperate sclerotinian with a Nordest Atlantic and Mediterranean distribution is generally con uh, considered a hard bottom species. And this common view of uh, dendrophilia as a typical hard bottom species is largely accepted since the first studies targeting uh, this organism. Uh, Le Danois, for example, reported that it only settles on uh, rocky bottoms and uh, avoid muddy ones. Also, Perez and Picard in their uh, Nouveau Manuel de Bionomie Bentique uh, reported the dendrophilia as uh, typical of the biocenosis of the Roche du Large uh, in the Circa Littoral Plain. However, recent studies indicate that the species present a, a wide adaptability to, their, to, to a, a wide range of environmental features, which allow the species to participate in different biochenosis, including those located at mesophotic depths, but also at batia depths, including, including white coral reefs. Curiously, more recently, the endrophilia population has been reported from soft bottoms, both along the Italian coast and also French coast. And uh, this uh, indicate that the common view of dendrophilia as a typical hard bottom species is at least simplistic. Uh, the video we are seeing um, show the peculiar population uh, located at the base of the Mantische Shoal in the Ligurian Sea, where dendroph dendrophilia colonies create uh, a dense and large meadows um, located on um, uh, ice-silted uh, detritic bottoms. Uh, this uh, finding indicate that this species can create a variety of different patches, often associated with different substrate and habitats. And uh, this highlights more uh, comprehensive conservation issues. 
the, high, the aim of this study is then to identify the different facets created by dendrophilia and to characterize the different ecological preferences uh, related with uh, each facet with a particularly um, specific regard uh, with the, the substrate on which they develop. To do this, we create a large data set by including information from an extensive bibliographic research, but also from more than 600 new records um, uh, coming from ROV, remotely operated vehicles, exploration along the Italian coast. All these data were analyzed uh, in order to obtain information on uh, spatial and bathymetrical distribution, substrate type, inclination, population structure, and associated species. Uh, this map shows the distribution of dendrophilia cornigera according to substrate type. The majority of the record indicate that uh, these species mainly settle on hard bottoms, mainly represented by outcropping and subcropping rocks, rocks encrusted by coralline algae, and also cold water coral frameworks. Record on soft bottoms are also common, both in the Mediterranean and in the Northeast Atlantic Ocean, um, accounting for almost one fifth of the total. Significant differences in dendrophilia size have been detected among, um, among the different substrate, with colonies settled on soft bottoms being generally smaller than, do, than those uh, settled on uh, hard grounds. This is probably because of the high instability of the soft bottoms, uh, causing the larger colonies to overturn. Three main facets of dendrophilia have been uh, identified. The most peculiar one is uh, dominated by um, dense monospecific meadow of uh, dendrophilia gen uh, on soft bottoms. And the second one is represented by dendrophilia tanatofaces, which may present or may not living colonies. And the last one is uh, characterized by the presence of uh, scattered living colonies, generally associated with uh, uh, different biogenosis. Scattered living colonies and thanatophages results, result quite uh, um, common both in the Atlantic and in the Northwest, uh, so, sorry, both in the Mediterranean Sea and in, in the Northwest Atlantic. But the dense meadows of dendrophilia uh, are has been, have been identified only in two sites, namely the Mantice Shoal in the Ligurian Sea and the Amendolara Bank in the Ionian Sea. Each facet is characterized by a specific combination of environmental setting. For example, scattered living colonies occur on uh, a large variety of uh, hard bottoms uh, in, in different uh, inclination and in a large, uh, in a broad bathymetrical range, whereas dense middle dendrophilia only occurs in sub-horizontal soft bottoms in a very narrow bathymetrical range from 100 to 140 meters. Dendrophilia tanatofaces occur both on hard and soft bottoms, uh, mainly at uh, batial depth, uh, more precisely in the upper batial between 200 and 500 meters depth. Associated fauna include uh, several species, among which uh, encrusting sponges, hydrozoans, scleractinians, serpulids, polychids, and cedarids uh, are the most common. Beside these species, other organisms um, results uh, typical of each dendrophilia facies. For example, serianthids and the sabellid mixicola is um, 
are typical of the dense middle fasces, whereas amacantha falcula and uh, brachiopods are typical, typically associated with dendrophilia thanatofaces. In conclusion, uh, dendrophilia present a wider adaptability if compared to other uh, cold water corals. And, uh, um, and the present study enlarge the extend this adaptability to substrate type and inclination. The majority of the records are reported for our grounds, where dendrophilia colonies generally um, join, take part to other biocenosis, like those dominated by sponges and uh, anthozoans. And uh, this, um, uh, this aspect has been taken in consideration by the most updated classification system of the Barcelona Convention. This classification system, anyway, does not present a proper category for the dendrophilia population developing on soft bottom. And this is despite the wide distribution of this population, the occurrence of at least two identity population, and also uh, with respect to the high vulnerability of these fascias with, with respect to trolling activities. Uh, in addition, the ability to settle on uh, soft bottoms uh, seems to be widespread within the dendrophilia genus, with the dendrophilia ramea being also reported forming uh, um, aggregation on soft bottom. Uh, however, the Barcelona Convention classification system does present a specific category for uh, dendrophilia thanatofaces. Just uh, one last uh, consideration could be made about the similarities be uh, between uh, dense dendrophilia dense meadows and thanatofaces, which may represent uh, different phases of the same faces. Um, in fact, the continued accumulation of uh, dead branches may lead uh, a situation dominated by living uh, colonies in another one dominated by dead, br dead branches. Um, Large-scale climatic, uh, climatic fluctuation may also lead to the formation of completely dead thanatogenosis and the wide occurrence of uh, these uh, faces, the thanatogenosis, may indicate as that the mesophotic dendrophilia meadows were probably more common in the past that, uh, than today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco, for this really nice presentation. And uh, we're discovering new species, new places for deep sea, and even new habitats or fascias, which is rather encouraging. Um, so there's time for questions. Ricardo. Yeah. Yes, hello. First, thank you for this information because it's uh, really very, very important. As you have said, this uh, dendrophilia ramea, in the other case, has been found in soft bottoms in Cyprus and in Lebanon. And with dendrophilia cornigera, as you were explaining, is mainly in, in hard bottoms. But we are finding that it's also in, in soft bottoms. We found it also in the Aeolian Islands that they were in soft bottoms. My question is uh, two questions. One is, uh, are they free living or are they somehow fixed to a substrate that maybe is below? Because some, in some cases you can find that you have a, a small layer of mud and it's fixed. And in some other cases, it's just free living on the soft bottom. And the second question is that, have you seen if these uh, aggregations 
are important for fish because in other places that we have found in muddy bottoms, when you have these corals, at the end, they are attracting a lot of fish. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, we think that, uh, of course, dendrophilia larvae settle on uh, small pebbles and uh, shell fragments, but they are free living. Then they grow and they remain uh, free living in the sediment. And uh, the second question, Yes, we, we see um, a rich associated fauna, including fish. For example, we, we have some uh, interesting pictures of uh, uh, Pagellus erythrinus on the dendrophilia meadows. Okay, thank you. Are there some more questions? No. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. For this Thank nice you, work and So now we'll be moving on the state of knowledge of caves um, with a presentation from Andre. Litistid sponges from submarine caves of Crete Island, hidden diversity and false endemicity. Should I ask? <laughs> Hello, everybody. First explanation, it's a little different format than for everybody, but I prepared it much earlier and, and no chance to, uh, to change. So today uh, I will try to present to you the results of our most recent studies of uh, sponges, litistic sponges inhabiting submarine caves, particularly submarine caves in the Crete, uh, Crete Island. But because my experience is that people rarely know what is a litistic sponge. Sorry, how to put it down? Ah, this one, okay. So first explanation, explanation, what are litistic sponges so that everybody know what we are talking about. This is a polyphyletic group of demo sponges that have carnosomal skeleton composed of articulated spicules called desmas. I will show it in a moment. The other demo sponges have loose spicules. The litistic sponges are known from deep water in tropical and warm water areas. Rarely, they occur in shallow water and then usually in, in caves. Uh, I mentioned about this desmas. And that means carnosomal spicules of litistic sponges. I will show you some examples of desmas, not all types of desmas, but uh, it's, they are easy to recognize and they constitute of basis of classification of litistic sponges. So each type of desma characterize different family. These, for example, these desmas are called megaclones. These desmas are called spheroclones. These desmas are called rhizoclones. We'll see them later. And these desmas are called tetraclones. As you see, they are very, very, very different and easy. To recognize. And these are called uh, dicranoclones. And we'll see them also later. So we know what are litistic sponges, more or less. And litistic sponges in caves, they are known all over the world. You have the, the most important uh, caves all over the world with, with uh, litistic sponges. Uh, uh, reported. But the, of course, Mediterranean area with this extensive uh, 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 research on submarine caves and also on sponges shows, of course, a, a lot of information, new information. Not all indicated here caves uh, are described with, with litistics, but they are also unpublished data. But we'll concentrate on Crete Island. Uh, there are five caves in which large population, often very large population of litistic sponges have been found. They are both from northern coasts, that means Seals Cave and Blue Cave, Nilhania and Blue Cave, Nil Heraklion. And in the southern coast, we have a, a, a litistic cave in Sfakia, Italian cave in Sfakia, and Blue Cave 
uh, and seal cave in also in Irhania. Five five different five different uh, caves. Litistics occur usually in semi-dark and especially in dark parts of the caves. And what is interesting, they are mostly associated with some freshwater inputs, some freshwater sources or freshwater lenses. It sounds strange, bizarre, because they are marine animals. So we just thought how it is. And we measured, in some cases, we were able to measure the contents of silicate in seawater. And as you know, the content of, sil of, of silicate in seawater is very low, uh, below one uh, micromole. But close to the places where litistid occur, when, it, when there are these freshwater inputs, uh, the contents of silicate in seawater may be even 10 times higher. And this is probably the reason why the sponges uh, especially drive in, in such areas. All these uh, caves are shallow, shallow water is nothing, nothing deep. So let's have a look at the animals itself. And the most common is Neophrysia spongia and Dumensis. It forms a large, sometimes very large masses of folded sponge body, usually white, thick lamella. And it's, it's known in several caves. And originally it was described, uh, described from uh, Andum cave near Marseille and considered it as an endemic. And now we have it in Crete Island and also unpublished result indicates that it occurs also in some caves in Azores. So this pattern of endemicity and, you know, difference between Western and Eastern Mediterranean disappears in this case. How it looks, uh, so you have example, how looks the skeleton of this sponge, composed of uh, uh, canosomal desmas called bicranoclons and microsclers plus other loose speakers. I will not go into details of, uh, uh, of it in the moment. Another one is found recently, never reported before from pre island is Gastrofanella fenicensis. It was described originally from Lebanon coast. And it is easy to recognize because it has, again, a different type of dust mask uh, called rhizoclones. I have shown you that before them. And again, different microsclers. <laughs> and gast so Gastrofanella fenicensis is, is known at least from two caves in, in, in Greece, in, in Crete in, and in Lebanon. And then it comes to the, another a, a, a sponge called Microscleroderma lamina, also described uh, originally from Lebanon coast and never from other caves. It resembles a little uh, a, a, the, the first one of Rhesuspongia and Dumensis because it forms masses of folded plates. Uh, it looks, as for me, it looks very different from Neofrisospongia, but it was always often mistaken with Neofrisospongia due to this lamellar habit and folded. In fact, it's, it's, it's never white. Uh, and it, this is enough to tell that it's a different, uh, different stuff than Neofrisospongia. And again, it has like uh, uh, Gastrofanella, it has uh, Desmas, a kind of somal skeleton composed of rhizoclones and very small microsclers called sigma spears. But all this can be done only, uh, only in the lab. So field work doesn't help to do and probably the la uh, and last and probably the most interesting discovery is discovery of new species probably also new genus it's very recent so I, we we didn't decide yet that belongs to family Fimarafinide. it has very peculiar desmas if you look at at the bottom uh, photo you see that the desmas have very long spine it, it's impossible to mistake with anything else and it is known only from that uh, it is known now from Atlantic from about 2000 meters, 1000 meters from Azores. And what's more, this sponge is the second in abundance after Neophrysospongia in, in all those Cretan caves. And the most <laughs> bizarre thing was that it was it's not it's known since long, but it was reported as Petrosia due to 
outer resemblance, morphological resemblance to, to Petrosia. And when I saw it first time on photos, I told it's probably discodermia. No, 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 they told me Petrosia. And finally, they told me, no, it's probably discodermia. I've got the specimens, I studied it this under SAM, and it's going, no, it's new filmaraffinid sponge. So this study needs always, it must be very careful with determination with, you know, when only diving. And uh, our studies revealed that these caves uh, may contain a lot of litistids. They are, you know, probably the first uh, visible uh, uh, sponge and organism in, in the caves. Thus, we describe it as a new, according to Barcelona Convention, you know, process of, of describing of uh, habitats as, as a new facies uh, with litistid with, uh, 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 sponges. And just coming to the end, probably the question will be more important, that systematic studies has proven that four litistic spe species that belong to four different genera and four different families occur in marine caves of Crete Island, sometimes in great quantities. Earlier, oh, there was only one case, in fact, it was Discodermia from uh, Trois-Pepe near Marseille. Our studies, studies revealed also the presence of a new species and probably new genus of Fumaraffini sponge for the first time in the Mediterranean. And this group is known from deep water Atlantic. The new species was mis mis misdetermined in earlier studies as Petrosia. And the presence of these four litistic taxa, sometimes in high abundance and large masses in the dark cave parts, uh, with freshwater springs, corroborates previous suggestions. We published earlier the paper about on, only about no frisospongia suggesting this relation between silicate, freshwater input, and so on, that their presence could be linked to higher concentration of silicate in seawater due to freshwater uh, influx. And the presence of four different species of litistic sponges in five marine caves of Crete including taxa known only from Western Mediterranean or even Atlantic Ocean and Lebanon, contradicts current ideas about their diversity, distribution and origin. Because this was always often suggested is one cave, one sponge, and totally endemic nowhere else. They were even suggesting that they live there and developed in the cave. It seems that it's not true. And Final conclusion for the future is that limited exploration of marine caves, regional lack of expertise and superficial examination without sampling and taxonomic identification based on speakers, the base of taxonomy of sponges, often leads to mis misidentification and suggests no existing pattern in diversity and endemicity. Thank you. And Well, thank you very much, Andre. It was uh, really interesting. Here again, we have new species. It sounds like if we go in, in, in a cave, we can find new species <laughs> or something like that. I mean, there's still work to be done. So now there's some time. And thank you also for the timing. Very good. Uh, there is some time for some questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, about the photograph you have shown of the listicid the sponges, uh, did you find them in the semi-dark area or in the deeper past or the inner most part of the cave? Uh, sorry, this question probably should be answered by <laughs> Vasilis because he collected it. So I know, so maybe he will answer. Uh, yeah, I know a little bit, but he's an expert on it. So I'm a, it a lab person. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, it was always find uh, which of the latest is first. It was usually find in the dark part of the caves or sometimes in the semi-dark. 
Well, I remember there was even a case where it was found very close to the entrance. The defining characteristic was that it was always found very close to the freshwater lens, just a few centimeters below the freshwater water lens. And this is why we discussed with Anze this possibility that it has to do with uh, the silicate level at, uh, in the water. Uh, but usually the quantities and the coverage is much higher in the dark part of the cave. And it forms this kind of aggregations that can be in, in big quantities. And this is why we described it as a new uh, facet in the Mediterranean Sea. So, thank you. Some other question? I, I had a question. Uh, um, how old can sponges, as the big one you had showed, that uh, can they be? Um, the, the, you had a photo with the big sponge that was yes, uh, folded. And yeah, folded. Uh, like, how old could it be, this sponge? The, how much time? How much time? How old? Yes. Oh, yes. We published in a previous paper on Neophrys Aspongia. We have made very how to crude approximation, taking what we know about growth rate of some other litistids, but they are from the Pacific. So it, it's not necessarily the same, but we discovered maybe several hundred years old that the big one, you know, but there are some suggestions for deep water hexactinelli that maybe even thousands of years. It's People do not agree with this, but it's also the question uh, about caves and litistid sponges. Uh, there were some suggestion, uh, not very clever, that the that this endemicity, it follows from the fact that they are survivors from the geological past, from the Mesozoic. But it's not true because the caves were uplifted, yes. you know, <laughs> earlier. <laughs> so only after, uh, after recent uh, deglaciation, yeah. when the sea level rose, uh, they could develop. And uh, However, I am aware of the sponges which probably existed in uh, submarine today, submarine caves in the interglacial period because they are fossilized. They are no okay. such. And this several hundred years old, it fits more or less with the calculation of uh, when the cave was submerged. Okay. More or less, not ideal, yeah. but so it's only only a crude ap approximation. No, no particular data. Andrzej, okay. if I may add. Uh, I think we have calculated based on this approximation between seven and nine hundred years old uh, for the largest specimen, which was approximately not approximately was one meter large in diameter, so really really big, and in a very very shallow uh, semi-submerged cave. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Mr. President. Um. So continuing with caves, um, Carlo will present us uh, the sea caves of the Marine Protected Area of Portofino, Ligurian Sea, lack of knowledge and management. Uh, merci, Madame le Président. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, senor and signori. Uh, I'm sure that the most of you know where is uh, located Portofino. It's not far from Genoa, where we are. It's a rocky promontory, a marine protected area, and uh, its rocky bottoms uh, host a number of uh, marine caves. Uh, you know, marine caves are protected habitat. Portofino is a marine protected area. So you may expect that uh, we know everybody about this cave, so we have a management plan. Not at all. We don't know nearly nothing about the submarine caves of Portofino. And uh, so I take this opportunity to show you the result of some uh, expeditions, uh, topographic surveys, and the first list of conspicuous species that inhabit these caves. Uh, these caves are known, on the contrary, to divers, to recreational divers. And uh, there are uh, many uh, diving sites of Portofino which host uh, caves. Uh, the name of cave uh, is, is even in some um, site name. Grotta is the Italian word for cave. And this uh, visitation by divers uh, 
uh, has also caused some uh, accident in, in the past. The first uh, scientific knowledge about uh, these caves uh, come from the late 50, when a diver, Giulio Marcante, collaborated with a scientist, Enrico Tortonese, to study the uh, rocky uh, seafloor of Portofino. Marcante the show, uh, told the Tortonese about the caves uh, located about 40 meters, and the Tortonese himself uh, um, mentioned uh, shallow water caves uh, in emerging caves. And sorry, but uh, everything I show this uh, photograph, uh, I, I have some emotion because Mercante was my master of uh, scuba diving and Tortonese was my master of uh, natural history. And uh, nearly 15 years after, the Italian Marine, uh, the Italian Ministry of uh, the, the Environment and the Sea promoted uh, a census of the marine caves uh, in Italy. And uh, in this census uh, were indicated uh, nine caves. Uh, you found probably the CD outside that I show in this one. So feel free to take it. And uh, of these uh, nine caves, uh, just uh, we, we knew that just way there, nothing more. Uh, I show you a typical page of this census. You see, SN means there is no cadastral number. Okay, the name, Shims Cave, for example, and uh, is not surveyed. And all information comes from diving center. No scientific data at all. The Shims Cave, of course, uh, takes its name by the huge amount uh, of the, the, the shrimp, uh, Plesonica narval. Uh, we did uh, quite recently an expeditious, expeditious survey. The cave is relatively deep, uh, but for the rest, there's no problem for diving a chess. And uh, in addition to the shrimps, uh, the cave hosts uh, uh, some other species of uh, um, conservation interest, uh, such as lobster and uh, rocky lobster, including juveniles. And uh, I have a short video about this cave. So let's get in the cave. Uh, the first uh, thing we see is a conspicuous population or the folk bird, uh, uh, Fichis uh, You see, we are still in the, in the first part of the cave and uh, this fish is quite numerous. On the wall, you see the typical fauna of confined caves, uh, just in casting sponges uh, and little more. And you may see that the fish is quite common with also uh, individuals of, of important size. You have here an example. And then in the inner part of the cave, there are the shrimps. Really huge swarms, a thousand of individuals. They are uh, everywhere on the bottom. You see how many on the walls. Literally thousand, I'm not exaggerating. And okay, now we take the, the way back. I get out from the, the cave. You see again the wall. So with the Petrosia fichiformis in particular and other encrusting sponges, serpulids, as in every cave. And uh, the floor is uh, sandy muddy. Okay, we, we meet again the fichis fichis. We approach uh, the, the exit. And you may see, uh, okay, uh, Apogon in Berbis, as, as in every cave, <laughs> is quite common. And uh, you may see in, in the next uh, photogram that uh, there is a queue of uh, divers waiting for their turn to get in the caves. So really the caves uh, of Portofino are highly visited. Okay, you see feces, feces, some small erected sponges. Uh, 
you see it's quite big, the, 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 the fish. Fortunately, there is the protection. If not, I, I probably, <laughs> we didn't find this fish. Okay. You see the divers waiting for their turn. And there is really a queue. Okay, the same shrimps uh, is, can be found in uh, another caves uh, at the other side of the promontory. This is a shallow caves, so no problem to visit for the diver, but uh, this morphology is uh, make, uh, make it difficult to, to get out. And uh, a, a group of caves well known to divers is the Dovecote Caves, uh, which include the, the caves described by, described, mentioned by the Tortonese and Marcante. You see the Marcante is the deeper cave, the, the shallow water cave of Tortonese. And there is a third uh, cave at intermediate depth. The Tortonese cave uh, arbor, uh, most of the typical fauna of the marine caves. And uh, as a, a relatively complicated morphology, which may cause uh, some trouble to diver because uh, uh, you can rise to the surface is a sort of inner lake. And if there is some swell, getting out may be difficult. And uh, it happened that the divers remain trapped for hours within this lake. The Armatum cave is so called because of the great abundance of the hydroid identity Marmatum at the entrance. It's a tunnel shaped cave at, uh, at a depth which uh, gave no problem to, to divers. Um, the Mercante caves uh, is relatively deep. There is no big problem to access uh, this cave, but here the divers can impact the rich population of uh, Corallium rubrum on the vault of the cave, uh, a population that had been studied years ago by Giorgio Balestrello and the late Riccardo Catania Vietti. Uh, okay. <laughs> and the Corallium rubrum is also present uh, in a tunnel shaped cave, uh, which is other way characterized by scleratinian corals. Always a problem of impact by diving. Okay, now we can say that we have some piece of information about 11 caves in, in the Portofino promontory, but for only six of, of them, the underlined ones, uh, we have at least an expeditious survey. So it's not enough. It's better than nothing, okay? But uh, we would need some more detail to manage, uh, for example, the access to the different caves. Uh, Probably there are other minor cavity or around the promontory. And the, the, the caves are open at three depths in general. And they, probably this uh, depth correspond to uh, phases of uh, sea level standing during the last marine transgression. And uh, all, of our, all, all our uh, rockfall or marine erosion cave, the rock of Portofino is, uh, is a pudding, so it's a conglomerate, it's not the best kind of rock to have a big cave. Uh, and the fact that, that the cave is small, uh, as, as, two, as two faces, you know, um, on an end, uh, a diver cannot get lost. On the other end, uh, can be trapped. So, I mean, there is need uh, to manage the visitation to caves. Uh, as I told you, the caves uh, arbor some species of conservation interest. So, um, lack of knowledge, problem with the diversity, and need of protection combine to ask for management plan, which are still lacking after 20 years of institution for the marine protected area. I thank you very much. And well, thank you, Carlo, for this very nice and refreshing dive into the caves and for the timing as well. So uh, there is some time for questions.
Hi. There are deeper caves, like in the Mesophotic area of Portofino. I don't know, but I suspect that there are no, no deeper caves because uh, at about 40 meters, uh, the, the rocky cliff ends uh, on a sandy biodetritic bottom. But it's true that there are some steel rocks here and there, uh, but uh, I don't think the divers normally adventure at 50 or 60 meter depths looking for caves. I hope so. <laughs> okay, thanks. Do you think that these streams could uh, promote the diversity in these caves? I mean, by transporting urban matter from inside and uh, from outside to inside of the caves? And especially at, I guess, the, uh, the web are really seeing the streams migrate from the inner part to the other part. Thank you. I think so, but there are no specific studies about that streams, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, what you said has been quite demonstrated for the fish apogon in Bernvis, uh, for mesits, uh, and the suspected. Uh, uh, or feared for many other multi species which perform daily migration within outside the cave. Uh, I know that this shames, uh, the Prisionica and Arval, is fished on uh, epibatial bottom. So probably I suspect that it migrates daily from uh, 300, 400 meters to the caves. I suspect. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and there's uh, a question here in front. I have only a comment, sorry. I'm Valentina Capanera, I'm working in Portofino MP, and I uh, want only to, to the specification regarding what uh, Carl Nick Bianca said. As a Portofino MP, we have a management plan since 2010. I underline this because we are also on the site since 2005, uh, but we don't have specific conservation measures regarding uh, caves, probably because this uh, lack of knowledge that uh, you underline. So we have to <laughs> increase this study regarding uh, uh, caves and also coralligenous and the importance of uh, uh, the evaluation of human impact, especially uh, the diving uh, regarding this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Valentina. I'm very, very happy that you are here because I was willing to be provocative uh, for this respect. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy that you got the message. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, as you're mentioning management, I was wondering which kind of measure you can imagine to protect this kind of uh, of cave and this? Uh, okay, it, this is not my job, but uh, I, what I may suggest uh, is uh, if you have good um, uh, surveys of the caves and you can evaluate uh, very well even the safety for the divers and the risk of impact by the divers, two, two sides. And possibly you can ask uh, for, uh, uh, you can also prohibit uh, pen the penetration of some caves, but you can ask, for example, that the diving guide um, ask for a specific um, certificate about cave, di cave divers or something like that. So some restriction measure about visitation. At present, it's completely free. So there is no rule. So everybody can enter in the caves, uh, in theory. But, uh, then I hope that people which don't feel confident with caves don't, doesn't enter, but you know, there is no rule. Okay, I, I have a small question. Um, what, what is the pressure like in summer, for example? We're talking about uh, a frequentation of how many divers by day up uh, approximately. I think that Valentina know better than me, but I I, to, I heard about uh, 
80,000 dice per year or something like that. Huh? Per days. Okay, you can divide the... <laughs> By year, per... Per years, uh, it's a long, uh, it's a long story, the long, a long discussion. Uh, Portofino MPA is uh, one of the most used MPA uh, for the diving frequentation at Mediterranean, uh, at Italian level, I can say. Um, we have a lot of uh, dives every year. Um, we can uh, consider the, this specific site is uh, is not one of the most frequented. We have uh, other um, sites that are mo most used. Uh, but uh, for this specific site, I can say five. Uh, uh, 5,000 uh, uh, dives per year. 5,000. Five. Okay. Uh, I had eight too much. <laughs> no, eight, I think, is uh, too much. Okay. Anyway, many thousand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo, for all this information. And yeah. um, so we're having a presentation by... So the following presentation is by Marco that is going to present a comparison of Baltic assemblages from six marine caves in a protected area of the south southeastern Aegean Sea in Greece. Hello everyone, I'm Marcos Diginis and uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Union University and the Hellenic Center for Marine Research in Greece. And today I'm going to present you a research study on the comparison of benthic assemblages for six marine caves in a protected area of the southeastern Aegean Sea in, in Greece. Uh, this study was um, uh, was uh, in the framework of my master thesis. Um, but what are marine caves? Uh, marine caves are underwater cavities with dimensions that allow both uh, entry and exploration by humans. Um, and they are usually formed in limestone, uh, mainly by karstic erosion and wave action. Marine caves can be uh, simple or complex in morphology. And they are characterized as uh, by the biodiversity reservoirs or refuge habitats because they host several uh, endemic, rare, protected, and deep water species, as well as uh, unique bioconstructions. But during the last decades, several threats and pressures have been detected in uh, marine caves. Uh, most important of which are the water temperature rise, the expansion of uh, island species distribution, the coastal and marine infrastructure uh, construction, marine litter, and unregulated recreational activities, as we saw at the previous uh, presentation. Through this study, we aim to compare the benthic communities of uh, six marine caves to record uh, rare protected and alien species and to investigate the effect of different topographic and morphological features on the structure of their benthic communities. Our study area is uh, a protected uh, area at the North Carpathos and Saria Islands, at the southeastern uh, part of the Aegean Sea in Greece, as we can see in this map. Um, during sampling, uh, 76 uh, sites were examined um, within the borders of this marine protected area, uh, which is also a Natura 2000 area. For more uh, information, you can see a presentation from our collaborator, uh, Thanos Dailianis, at the next uh, session. From all of these sites, six marine caves were chosen for quantitative study of their uh, hard substrate benthic communities. Two of them uh, are fully submerged and they are at the north part of uh, Carpathos Island, as we can see on the map. And four of them are on the coastline of um, Saria Islands and 
these four are semi-submerged. This study was funded uh, by a research uh, project and was co-financed by Greece and the European Union. As we know from, uh, from the literature, um, the benthic communities develop in marine caves at different ecological cave zones. So we have the, the entrance zone um, where rhodophytes uh, dominate. And, and then we have the intermediate semi-dark zone where sponges uh, dominate. And uh, the last zone is the, the completely dark inner zone where we can find mostly polychaetes, uh, small uh, sponges and brachiopods. Uh, none of the, of the studied uh, caves had a dark zone or their dark zone was very, very small. So uh, we, we took samples only from the, from the entrance zone and the, the semi-dark zone of the studied caves. So during sampling, we took uh, topographic measurements and um, visual, visual sensors was also applied. Um, uh, photos of uh, five uh, quadrats were taken from uh, each of the, op of the opposite walls of its ecological cave zones, uh, cave zone. And we can see that the size of, uh, of each quadrat was 25 to 25 uh, centimeters. Here we can see some examples of uh, these quadrats from the entrance zone of uh, two of the studied caves and from the semi-dark zone of uh, the same caves. Um, all the photos were processed through the uh, PhotoQuad uh, software. And as we can see here, uh, 100 points were overlaid uh, over its um, uh, analyzed quadrat. And, um, and then we identified the species and we calculated the coverage of uh, its uh, identified taxon. In total, 81 taxa were identified, most of which were sponges, as we can see with uh, yellow color. Uh, we had uh, 37 sponges, followed by 13 bryozoans and 10 macroalgae. In this map, we can see the location of these caves and um, the species richness of the different taxa um, for each ecological cave zone. So we can, we can easily see that sponges with yellow color dominate in terms of species richness for every ecological cave zone. Here we can see a, a map with the percentage of coverage for all the identified taxa. Uh, we can see that uh, at all um, the cave entrances, we have uh, macroalgae with red color that dominate, mm -hmm. and uh, their coverage is higher for uh, the caves that are on the coastline of Saria Islands because these caves are semi-submerged. For the semi-dark zone, we have uh, sponges uh, dominating in terms of coverage for most of the caves. And when this is not the case, we have uh, mostly non-living uh, substrate with gray color. In total, 11 uh, protected species were recorded, as well as species of commercial interest for local communities in Carpathos and Saria Islands. Uh, as an example, Plesionica narval, uh, the same shrimp that we saw at the previous presentation. Uh, in total, uh, 17 species were recorded for the first time in marine caves of Greece. And based on the, on the results of the uh, coverage uh, data, uh, of the coverage um, analysis, uh, a, a, re a resemblance analysis was uh, assembled. Uh, Photoquadrat uh, samples were grouped in different clusters in the NMDS plots that we can see in this uh, slide by different ecological uh, zones, uh, plot A, by different uh, cave types, submerged and semi-submerged caves, plot B, uh, by, by entrances with different size, plot C, and different uh, depth level, plot D. Uh, One-way uh, anosim analysis uh, was performed for uh, six fixed uh, factors. These factors were uh, the cave, the ecological zone, the cave type, submerged or semi-submerged, 
the entrance area, depth, and orientation. Um, all uh, factors uh, were found to uh, that they uh, significantly affect the differentiation of the benthic communities among uh, the caves. Some threats and pressures were also recorded in the studied marine caves. Uh, alien species were recorded in all caves. Uh, 10 uh, alien species uh, were observed in total, most of which were fish. We can see some examples here. Partial or total necrosis of some taxa was also observed. Uh, five taxa uh, had necrosis um, reaching uh, in coverage up to 12% in a single quadrat. These taxa were mainly uh, sponges, but some uh, bryozoans and corals were broken, um, probably due to divers or due to gravity. Marine litter was also observed in most of the caves. We, we know that marine litter can cause uh, mobile species trapping and smothering of sessile organisms, such as bryozoans and sponges. Based on the results of this uh, study, we suggested uh, several management and protection uh, actions for the uh, MPA. And uh, among these actions were um, a monitoring plan with current methodology combined with recording of different environmental uh, factors, the assessment and quantification of several impacts, such as marine litter and alien species, and to raise public awareness regarding the importance and value of marine caves. To sum up, in uh, all studied caves, um, all studied cave has uh, had a rich biodiversity, and their benthic communities uh, were differed, differed between different ecological cave zones and different morphological cave types. All topographic and morphological uh, features significantly affected the cave community structure. 17 species were recorded for the first time in marine caves of Greece. Uh, 11 protected and 10 alien species were recorded, and marine litter was observed in most of the studied caves. For more information, you can read our uh, paper, which was recently published uh, at the Journal of Marine Science and Engineering. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marcos, and thank you for the timing. Perfect. So there is time for questions. Thanks, Marco. My name is Alfonso Ramos from University of Alicante, Spain. The question is, uh, I see the different orientation of the caves in Carpatos. You have a east and west orientation. You have seen a difference with regard to the regimen wave, regimen at different parts. For example, the action of the, the heavy winds or the heavy surf and the caves. Um, you, you understand? Please. Yes, yes. Uh, how waves uh, affect the community. Um, I think that uh, waves affect the community mostly in semi-submerged uh, caves. Of course, orientation is, um, uh, is a factor that, as we saw, significantly affects the differences. But um, I think that uh, the pressure is higher when we um, compare semi-submerged and submerged caves, because semi-submerged caves are more exposed, exposed to uh, winds and wave uh, action. So the, the, the benthic communities are more stressed. Okay, so, some other question? No. I was wondering how much they were frequented by divers, these caves. Have you an idea? 
Um, yes, it was not the same for all cases. I mean, uh, some caves were a uh, diving site from a diving center uh, in Carpathos. Um, I don't have the exact number, I mean, how many divers go per, per season, but um, at least two of them are diving sites. Yeah. And but so did you see a difference between these that are diving sites and the other caves, or is it not really comparable? Um, it's difficult to compare now. We, we didn't see uh, differences that we can say for sure that it was due to uh, divers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. Thank you for the presentation. I, I think that uh, you mentioned that you were doing five photos in each area to characterize the, um, the community. Uh, so five from its opposite wall of its uh, ecological zone. Yeah. No, it's just a question uh, to know if you have done a previous study just to know if five photos, they are enough or not to characterize the wall. Because, for instance, I'm talking, I'm not working on marine caves, but uh, we work in just outside of marine caves, so in the coral Igenus, And we have been conducting some studies. So, first, we did a lot of uh, covers of uh, the surface, and then you make a kind of an analysis on how, what is the minimum amount of photos that you, or the surface that you have to cover. And I think that, uh, I mean, then you can discuss a bit, but uh, it's a way as well to that everybody. Uh, works in the same way and then you can compare the data across the different marine caves so it just if you have done i mean if five it's the right uh, number of photos to characterize that's perfect yeah. it just uh, this is the question sorry yes thank you so it's uh, it's five from its opposite wall so in total for each cave we have 20 quadrats uh, um, and we know from the, from the literature that uh, we, we need at least one square meter uh, minimum for uh, proper characterization. So with, with 10 quadrats for each marine cave, we, we have this, um, this data. But uh, we have also the limitation of time because uh, for, for most of the cases, we, we try to take more quadrats but uh, the time is limited to do all the work in a, in a single dive in a marine cave. And of course, we want all the, um, uh, the caves to be um, to, to have the, the same sample size so we can compare them. So we, we try to have uh, five from its opposite wall of its cave, of, of its ecological cave, um, so to have uh, better comparison. We, we use the same methodology at all uh, marine caves. Hello, Marcos. Uh, it's Tancred from uh, Istanbul University. I have a technical question about the methodology you use in order to perform the photo quadrat. Uh, from what I've seen in the literature, the uh, minimum size that was uh, considered was 50 centimeter on 50 centimeters uh, how the um, 25 centimeter on 25 centimeter rule was established or is it possible to uh, uh, increase the value of the photo quadrat we we try not to exceed this size because from a point that after um, for, for for the analysis of each photo, you have to zoom in to see all the the all the species that are in each quadrat. So from a point after, through zooming in, you cannot identify the the species. So we choose not to have very big quadrats, like half to half meter. Um, Again, we, we chose uh, 25 centimeters and not 15 uh, to have, to can compare the, the samples between marine caves. I mean, this was the methodology that we used at the beginning. And then 
it would be difficult to compare uh, quadrats from with different size from the different caves. Uh, hello, I just wanted to add something to the comment to what Marcus uh, uh, replied to. Uh, I think it was Kim's comment, Kim's question about the. Um, let's say the, the suitable uh, number of quadrats that should be collected. So what happened in this case is that one of the things that we did, and it was not presented in Marco's presentation, but it was uh, in the paper that he showed, is that we also ca um, calculated the EBQI index. And in this paper, it says that uh, the minimum uh, surface that we have to, to sample in every cave is uh, one, uh, it's, uh, one square meter. So this is why in our case, we decided that we're going to sample a little bit more than one square meter uh, using this 25 by 25 because of resolution, because if you use, you can use bigger quadrats, but then it's not uh, so easy to analyze all this, uh, these photographs and see the, the species in, in high resolution. And um, the other thing is that we had to do a very quick, a really rapid assessment and um, Sometimes in, in these expeditions, not only in Carpathos but in and Saria, but also in other islands, we have very, very few time. For example, we go to one island, we have to go to, to do one dive in one cave, collect as much as we can, and then move to the second cave or to another island. So we try to do the minimum that we can do, but to have a replication. So five replicate quadrats in, in, in every in every wall of, on every zone. So that's why we um, came to this conclusion. Okay, thank you, Vasily, and thank you, Marco. I had a, just a small question because there's no time. Uh, is it a method that you use also for other caves, or I mean, yes. you generally you stick to that method to characterize uh, these type of caves, right? Yes, we, we have used this um, methodology for more than 30 caves uh, across the Aegean Sea and Cyprus and Croatia okay. and Spain. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marcos. So now I think we have a presentation from Antonietta online. Um, new insight into the Briozoan diversity in marine caves of the Aegean Sea, where a lot in Greece, Eastern Mediterranean. Antonietta? Yes, I am here. Great. Great. I add some additional light. And I am going to uh, open my PowerPoint and to share the uh, screen. Do you see my presentation? Yes, but it's not in okay. full screen. Yes. Uh, what? It's not in full screen. Yes, yet. yes, I, I can. Okay, this is my presentation and we remain again in the Aegean Sea uh, because I am presenting here the results uh, of the analysis of uh, uh, Briodon uh, um, samples coming from uh, several uh, caves and water caves situated in this area. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bryozoans are among the main colonizers of hard substrates in the Mediterranean marine caves. And uh, if we consider the total uh, diversity of Bryozoans in the Mediterranean, that is about 50, 557 six species, uh, we have in marine caves a relevant proportion that is about 41%. So high quantity of bryozoans are present. But when we look at uh, where these bryozoans have been um, uh, reported, we look that they come mostly from the Western Mediterranean and the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and in particular, uh, Eastern Mediterranean and water uh, caves are still under underrepresented uh, in this uh, uh, set of results. So uh, we need to have more information about this area. And 
Um, if we consider uh, the area, we can see from the image that the map uh, that uh, this area is uh, one very rich in uh, submarine caves. So we have the opportunity to uh, look inside these caves to sample and to collect uh, for analyzing samples to have more biozones. But until now, uh, you can see only few points, uh, few caves have been uh, um, considered for the study of bryozoans and uh, actually uh, most of these areas, uh, from most of this area, bryozoans have been only uh, reported but not analyzed in detail. So, uh, in this case, so we uh, analyzed um, a lot of uh, uh, a relevant number of uh, uh, samples, 26 samples coming from uh, 15 different uh, underwater caves situated in the Aegean Sea and mostly in uh, um, areas uh, of the archipelagos that uh, are um, developed in this uh, in this area. Uh, so uh, you can see that for each site we have uh, a certain number of uh, uh, caves. Uh, sometimes only one cave and only one sample. Sometimes a few caves or um, a relatively high number of caves. For uh, for instance, or three in uh, Salia e Carpados that we uh, look already uh, in the previous presentation and a lot of caves from uh, Crete uh, because they are seven caves, different caves and uh, several samples. So uh, we uh, examined this, uh, um, this um, uh, samples and uh, um, we uh, obtained uh, different numbers of species. The number of species for each locality is reported in the uh, line, the, the, the last line. So the number of species we um, obtained for each of this sample is very variable, quite variable from one to about uh, 30 species in the uh, area of uh, um, Stachia in Crete. Uh, but uh, if we look at these preliminary results, we can see that, uh, though with some exceptions, the number of species is roughly correlated with the sampling effort. So more samples, more species. And uh, the highest number of species, uh, uh, 27 species, comes from a single, uh, a single cave, the Italian cave, that is situated in Crete. Um, some uh, caves resulted uh, very rich in species, and uh, we have, for instance, 18 species or 13 or 14 species in some caves. Uh, but the majority of uh, areas have very low uh, species richness. This probably also depends on the kind of uh, uh, samples because many samples uh, are only qualitative and uh, also uh, they are, are very small and sometimes only uh, single colonies were collected. So the number of um, of uh, species obtained from this sample is uh, very, uh, or it cannot be very numerous. Uh, most of the samples come from, uh, uh, of, of course, come from inside the caves, so they are uh, distributed in uh, uh, the different uh, ecological zone within cavities, uh, although they 
mostly come from semi-dark sectors, but we have also some uh, samples coming from uh, dark sectors. So the innermost and protected areas, but uh, uh, protected areas within caves. Uh, the total number of species we obtained is underestimated. And uh, if we examine the uh, photo quadrats that have been taken inside the caves, sometimes it is possible to look at uh, colonies that are relatively large, uh, so they can be visible and detected easily at uh, this uh, um, definition. And uh, for instance, uh, in this slide, I uh, can show you uh, three different species, Smithina cervicornis, this these uh, uh, branched colonies that is different from these ones that are Adonella calvetti uh, and with uh, smaller or uh, slender branches in comparison with the Smithina cervicornis. This is a, a colony of Reteporella and this is a colony of Ferrucella. Uh, I don't know the species, probably uh, Ferrucella de tubulosa that has this uh, kind of appearance. And it is the most common species reported from the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, if we look at these uh, um, uh, photographs, we can see that the number of species we obtained is underestimated. And probably we expect also that smaller species that are not visible on the uh, photographs can could be uh, detected uh, with an extensive sampling of the same caves. Uh, what uh, we can say about the distribution of these species, the most species that are uh, unique, uh, that means they have been detected only in one cave and most um, several times in only one sample. Uh, several other species are shared only by two caves, for instance, and uh, only a small number of species, in contrast, uh, occurs in uh, many caves. Uh, among the um, interesting things uh, we find, uh, for instance, uh, one is the Savignella Lafonti, that is this uh, um, species species consisting of bush-like colonies that uh, are made by uh, branches, very slender branches. This is the scale, uh, delicate branches consisting of unicellular um, lines of zoids, sometimes before cutting. Um, this species was very, very abundant in the Italian cave. Uh, and in the Antiquary cave. And uh, you can see the, um, the colonies can form a, a thick, uh, some centimeters thick uh, mat uh, with densely branches. So imagine these slender branches, uh, how many uh, branches are present here to give this aspect. Uh, and this is a quite uh, interesting thing because this is the first finding of mats of this species uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And uh, it was detected at the cave entrance. Uh, the depth is between uh, 15 and 17 meters. Uh, another particular species is uh, the Midronea triforis, a species that uh, actually occurs and uh, has been uh, reported from underwater, colon uh, underwater caves. And uh, it uh, is very abundant with uh, um, almost uh, uh, 20 colonies in the collected sample. But if we look at uh, photographs, we can see again this mat of uh, uh, branched uh, whitish uh, uh, situation where, of course, uh, um, the whitish uh, color is given by uh, serpulids, but uh, these are all branches of this bryozoan. These are same images of the same. Uh, so very common and very abundant uh, forming mat 
but with the uh, eye coverage on the surfaces of uh, the wall of the caves. Uh, what is also interesting is that uh, uh, the study of these uh, uh, samples from these underwater caves uh, provided uh, information and uh, allowed us to report some species for the first time in Greece or for the first time in uh, uh, underwater caves from Greece. Uh, these are some examples and particularly interesting is the occurrence of Gradoscrupocellaria ursuta disease. Uh, um, an erect, erect branched articulated species uh, and uh, this species has been detected um, for the first time in the Mediterranean quite recently about 10 years ago from uh, um, caves in the Sicily Strait and after in the Adriatic but the species was originally described from the Azore and uh, the presence, uh, its presence in the Mediterranean has been considered uh, puzzling and it is not clear if uh, is, uh, it is an introduced species or a cryptogenic species, but uh, genetic analysis are, have been not conducted until now. Uh, another interesting species is Celeborina galiciformis, but also other species have been um, recorded for the first time from Greece. Other species uh, that are quite common also in the eastern part of the Mediterranean and have been already reported from these areas are listed here. One is also figure the Cabarea Bori, and these are the reported for the first time from underwater caves in the Aegean. And uh, I was, uh, um, uh, um, it is very interesting also this one, uh, Bugula germane, that is a species uh, that is reported very rarely from the Mediterranean. And uh, this species was uh, described from Corsica. Uh, and uh, what is uh, uh, particular that uh, this is the first time it has been detected inside the underwater caves uh, because it was uh, first uh, reported from open sea, so uh, linked to uh, veget veg vegetate bottoms uh, with uh, um, algae or Posidonia meadows in the Western Mediterranean in uh, a depth range between 10 and 60 meters and uh, it was also uh, known from the eastern Mediterranean uh, because Armlen reported it from near Crete uh, but in open uh, environments at uh, great depth so uh, 108 meters. And what is more interesting is the possible presence or occurrence of uh, uh, species that have been uh, until now um, not uh, ascribed to a, a previous known species. Uh, so we identified some colonies that have been uh, um, indicated also at the genus level, sometimes even at the family level, because their characters are quite strange or um, the suite of characters, uh, the combination of characters is not uh, um, consistent and it is not possible to ascribe uh, these colonies to a particular uh, species already described species. One of these cases is this uh, celeborid. Uh, the colonies are very uh, nice, uh, some uh, uh, few centimeters high and a few centimeter large um, stout branches uh, and uh, we can detect also these colonies because they are large or large enough to be uh, detected with the underwater photographs and we can uh, when we um, observe these colonies to the SEM we can see some characters for instance the opening the zoids the um, um, avicularia, uh, but we have no ovicels, and ovicels are very important 
important in this group of organisms. So uh, fertile uh, zoids are very interesting and very relevant for the uh, generic attribution. Uh, what is... Uh, Sorry, uh, Antonia, yes? We yes, need I am going to the, to the conclusion, conclusion. Yes, because we're very sorry. late. <laughs> uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, so uh, this is a new, probably a new species. Uh, this is also another um, another example of a species that uh, is uh, not attributed uh, really to a, um, a defined species Reptadonella confronta violacea because uh, it has uh, characters of uh, Reptadonella violacea with small avicularia and uh, characters of uh, these other species uh, recently described from the Mediterranean, the color that is different from this one, so paddling species. And to conclude, uh, interestingly, uh, the number of species is uh, relatively high, uh, but uh, if uh, we consider other species, other caves that have been uh, um, studied in this area for bryozoans, we see that in, Sle in Lesbos Island, two caves have been uh, investigated with a number of uh, um, very um, relevant number of samples. And in that case, the uh, diversity is very uh, high compared to what we obtained from all these samples. And also uh, in the Lebanon area, some um, underwater caves have been uh, investigated along the coast with a um, relevant number of species and also relevant number, about seven species that are non-indigenous. So we uh, have, uh, we need to investigate further the, uh, the caves of the Aegean area for bryozoans to um, uh, have uh, um, better ideas about the total diversity, the quality of species, so uh, if they are native or if we have, uh, uh, as we can expect, um, non-indigenous species, and uh, uh, further studies are needed, of course. This uh, is all, and sorry for uh, going outside the time. Okay, thank you very much, Antonia, for, for, for this presentation. So I'm afraid we have the time for one question, um, perhaps. No, okay. Well, then I think we, we will... Uh, um, go ahead and Atef will give us. Thank you, Antonietta. Okay, we will Bye. break for. Thank you to you. We will break for uh, 15 minutes uh, and we come back for the next session. So, for the next session, I, uh, I would like to call uh, Nicolio Di Tulio to provide me with his presentation and also Michaela Gusti.
Okay. Good afternoon. We are going to start with the second session of the Dara Habitat Symposium. This session is about the study methods, mapping, and monitoring. As you have seen uh, in the dark habitats, we have like two different environments. One is the one that is in deep sea areas where the, the lights cannot uh, reach. And the other one is on caves where the light cannot reach. Despite these two uh, uh, environments, sometimes are quite far away from each other, they have very sim similarities and some things that they connect e each other. And now in this second session, we are going to have four presentations, two of them dealing with caves and two others dealing with deep sea habitats. And we are going to start with the, with the first presentation now, that is uh, the exploratory baseline survey of cave habitats within a marine protected area in the agency by Thanos Dailianis. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Hi again, everybody. Oh, I hope there is still some energy left after several um, very interesting uh, sessions today. So I would like to, to introduce my topic, uh, which is about an exploratory baseline survey of cave habitats within a marine protected area in the Aegean Sea. Uh, how does this move from... Oh, cool. Sorry for this delay. Okay, so I try to summarize the, my key points in the first slide. Uh, so this study aimed to explore the presence of uh, marine caves within uh, this marine protected area. And in total, uh, we explored uh, 70, uh, 57 uh, marine cave formations along 45 kilometers of uh, coastline. Uh, among these uh, 57 formations, 30 were selectively assessed regarding basic topographic characteristics, uh, their biodiversity, and also their conservation status. And of course, this information is quite essential for the establishment of knowledge and also for monitoring efforts regarding this priority habitat. Now, a few words about the distribution of the, of the marine cave habitat, uh, the habitat type 8330, according to the EU Habitats Directive in the Mediterranean. As we can see, and uh, probably we all know, it is quite uh, widespread, especially in the northern part that is uh, more rocky. Um, if we look closer, we can identify some uh, hotspots like the Northeastern uh, Adriatic Sea, the Aegean Sea, uh, the Tyrrhenian Sea, and also the coasts of Corsica and uh, Sardinia and the South uh, France coasts. And it is important to note here that uh, according to the European Environmental Agency, the, the conservation status of the um, uh, of this habitat in the Mediterranean and, and the Black Sea is uh, unfavorable, unfavorable or uh, inadequate. Now, zooming into the to the Aegean Sea, which is uh, our area of interest in this uh, uh, presentation, uh, we can see that uh, also the, the the presence of the eighty three thirty habitat is uh, very uh, widespread. Uh, it's almost omnipresent and the latest data indicate the presence of uh, more than 600 uh, marine caves and uh, this looks like uh, just the tip of the iceberg uh, since uh, more than 85 percent of this record uh, referred to semi-submerged caves so no one knows what happens in the deeper uh, depth zones um, and of course there is an increasing interest for monitoring and protection of this uh, um, habitat, which according to our belief is underrepresented uh, in uh, Aegean and possibly also in Mediterranean MPAs. So moving uh, along to the, to the study area, this is the, the um, marine protected area of Carpathos uh, and Saria Island, located in the southeast Aegean Sea. 
is the coastline you can see in the middle. Uh, it is one of the 400 Natura sites uh, in Greece. It comprises an area of 11,000 uh, hectares and 45 kilometers of coastline. And this is predominantly rocky. I mean, uh, almost 95% uh, of, the, of, the, of the coastline is uh, steep, rocky cliffs. Um, it's also mostly pristine. Uh, it does not host any major uh, urban settlements or uh, intensive uh, human activities. The most uh, intensive activity is fishing, and uh, there is only limited and uh, rather mild tourism. Um, now, uh, a few words about our study protocol. Uh, it lasted, uh, our work there lasted for seven days. We were a team of five diving scientists, and we had uh, valuable support from the MPA management agency. Um, the, the 55 sites along the coastline uh, were, um, were assessed by observation from the boat. And then for the most promising ones, we performed dives, either free diving, either with free diving or with scuba diving. And in some selected photos here, we, you can gain uh, a, an image of the, of the coastline, which is uh, rocky and predominating, predominate, dominated by these uh, openings and uh, cave-like formations, even above the sea level. So uh, out of the 57 observed sites, only 30 fulfilled the criteria for uh, more elaborate uh, work. So for these 30 cave, selected cave sites, uh, we performed some analysis of the topographic characters, like the, of course, geotagging the exact locations, uh, measuring the entrance dimensions and orientations, uh, the, the total length of the cave and uh, the zonation patterns. And we also perform a qualitative biodiversity assessment by visual sensors. At uh, seven selected uh, uh, more extended cave sites, we performed a quantitative bathing community assessment uh, with uh, non-destructive photo sampling and also the application of the cave ABQI index for the assessment of the ecological state. Now, just to give you a general picture of uh, the caves, these are not very extended caves. Um, the, their length uh, is um, measuring from 6 to, to well, 25 meters uh, for most uh, instances, and few extend the 25 meters uh, length. They're also quite shallow uh, with their, uh, their cave entrance uh, based at uh, uh, 5 or uh, maximum 15 uh, meters depth. So, regarding the general biodiversity assessment, uh, we identified uh, 68 uh, marine taxa. These were distributed in uh, 14 major taxonomic groups. And of course, uh, as uh, always in this type of habitat uh, in the Aegean Sea, invertebrates dominate, uh, mainly sponges. But also macroalgae, uh, mainly rhodophytes, uh, were present in the entrance zone. And of course, uh, and uh, also there was uh, some rich uh, fish biodiversity observed. And of course, a complete list of the recorded biodiversity was uh, provided uh, to the management agency of the MPA to use in future assessments. Now I will give you some um, uh, typical examples of uh, the major categories of organisms recorded uh, in these caves. Uh, first of all, the, the coralline algae that uh, dominated the entrance, uh, different species of lithophilum, mesophilum, and pacionelia forming extensive formations. Uh, porifera, which dominated the caves in terms of biodiversity, we, we uh, counted more than 20 species uh, in most of the caves. And some of those were typical, like uh, the Plasterella bistellata. Uh, some others are uh, uh, quite cryptic in the Eastern Mediterranean and, and can uh, hide uh, additional biodiversity. And also these uh, impressive formations of uh, Merlia Normani that uh, dominated the darker, the, the darker parts of the cave. Uh, for Cnidaria, the, the, the typical representatives were Leptopsamia provoti, which formed extensive uh, colonies uh, uh, in, uh, on walls, and also Madragis farensis, uh, which was abundant in all caves, uh, especially in the ceilings. And uh, for crustaceans, uh, there were some uh, protected species like uh, Scylarides latus, uh, quite uh, uh, well represented. But also in uh, almost all caves, we found uh, dense populations of uh, uh, Plesionica narval, 
which uh, actually, as uh, Carlo Nike said before, is a feast uh, and uh, specifically targeted in these uh, caves. And uh, for fish, of course, there were the typical inhabitants of caves like Apogon in Perbis, but also Antheas and Theas, which in Greece uh, has a uh, more de deep bathymetric distribution, but is often sited in caves uh, because probably it finds uh, favorable conditions uh, there. And also some protected species like the, the dusky grouper, Epinephalus marginatus. Uh, but uh, also, as, um, uh, as Marcos pointed out uh, before, uh, we, we observed alien species in all uh, marine caves examined. They were widespread in the area. And the most impressive presence was that of the lionfish, Terois miles, uh, which also surprisingly inhabited the darker parts of the cave. And uh, at least one lionfish was present in every cave examined. And uh, also these uh, big uh, schools of uh, ciganids uh, which uh, uh, frequent uh, the entrance of the cave, but uh, could also be seen migrating uh, in the darker parts. So the detailed assessment of uh, the, the macrobenthic communities uh, has already been published by Marcos, uh, uh, who gave the talk in the previous session. And I would like to move to some uh, concluding remarks here regarding this, uh, this uh, survey. So as a first attempt, to, to map and assess the, the, the marine cave habitat within the Carpathos MPA, we revealed the presence of uh, 30 uh, marine cave formations. It is important to note here that these cave formations had not been reported uh, in the past, uh, neither as uh, locations nor uh, as assessment of uh, biogenic, uh, biotic or abi abiotic features. And uh, uh, the, the data uh, produced here are valuable to map the distribution of um, uh, this type of habitats within this MPA and also in the Aegean ecoregion, but also to establish a baseline of uh, benthic community composition uh, in order and being able to evaluate the conservation status and shift uh, in the future. However, uh, uh, even if it, we did our best to, to, to actually explore uh, all instances of presence of this habitat, this cannot be considered as an exhaustive approach. Um, uh, as I said before, uh, the, 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 investigator, the investigation was limited to the 15 meters, so probably there are other uh, caves that we missed in deeper zones. Uh, also, of course, this is a time-consuming and resource-intensive uh, uh, type of survey, uh, that can also be considered low throughput, considering the, 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 the number of people and the number of days devoted in this kind of effort. So um, as, a, as a future outlook, I would like to highlight the, the, the need for at least discussing uh, possible high, high throughput methods for the investigation and exploration of this habitat in the Mediterranean. Uh, one obvious would be to use uh, diver propulsion vehicles to extend the, the, the survey range. And this could also be implemented in future surveys. Uh, but uh, one should also consider the use uh, and deployment of ROVs and possibly also AUVs uh, to increase efficiency and reduce dive time, which is valuable in these types of observations. Uh, also, the, uh, I could suggest uh, at least exploring the, the use of telemetry techniques, such as sounding, to at least identify potential hotspots of this uh, habitat uh, presence. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, the 3D photogrammetry method for assessing uh, both biotic and abiotic features. And I would like to thank you. <laughs> I'm open for any discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. If uh, I think that we have time for a couple of questions. You have questions. There is one over there, mm -hmm. Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Thanos. I comment with you uh, before, but I think that it's it's important to take in account now this important baseline studies. 
I mentioned you that in, in Medes Island, and I mentioned also to Carlo, that we have fortunately uh, have some data before from Mikel Zavala and Joan Domena Cross in the 17th. And the, the changes that experience these, these caves are incredible. So in the places that we don't have this, this previous data is, is really urgent uh, and, and really needed to have these base landing caves because it's really vulnerable ecosystem. So, and we have seen that there are many pressures in that system. So it's really welcome these studies that you perform there. So congratulations for the work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this comment, Christina. And of course I fully agree because um, uh, I think that baselines are the most important thing in this type of habitats. Uh, we all see the, the, the change that occurs in the coastal uh, reef habitats, which I think is faster than what's happening in the caves. But in, in the future years, we will definitely see change inside the benthic communities of the cave. And uh, it will be pity not to have a baseline to, to compare, at least to, to know what is happening, uh, if not to manage and conserve it and uh, uh, mitigate it, let's say. Another question there. Thank you, Thanos. Uh, one of the things I see is that we, you have very high number of uh, caves, and it's very interesting. But have you also tunnels? Excuse me? Uh, tunnels. Oh, uh, yes. Open, so open caves, because also it's a very important uh, yeah. topographic thing, because uh, always for filter feeder animals. Yeah. Yeah, I do not have the time here to go through all the all the different types of uh, caves uh, um, uh, investigated. But yes, at least uh, two of them were tunnels with uh, two entrances and uh, pass-throughs. And uh, this this sometimes have a different uh, type of community development uh, than the the normal typical blind cave, let's say. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, a few minutes ago, you talked about a different and more efficient way to survey underwater marine cave, and you mentioned ROV and remotely operated vehicles. Uh, do you know if anyone up to today have uh, ever used uh, this method, or is it considered as uh, an expensive uh, or too new uh, methodology? Yeah, I, I would say that it is not, um, nowadays it's not uh, that expensive, but uh, it is very, it is a difficult habitat to work with uh, with an ROV and also an AUV uh, because you have the confined space, you have the ceiling and uh, uh, the, the ROV can easily get entangled or uh, uh, trapped in the cave. So I, I'm really not aware of, uh, of um, any studies uh, uh, utilizing ROVs to, to actually explore the cave. But I think it is something that we should uh, at least uh, try uh, because it, it would expand our capabilities to, to map this habitat. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and we are going to move to the, to the next presentation by Nicolo Di Tullio that is the effects of global and local pressure on three submerged marine caves in the Western Mediterranean Sea. Good evening. Um, I already excuse the audience, but I'm going to read most of the of the speech. <laughs> so, the aim of the work is to answer the question about the change of marine caves over time in relation to local and global pressures. Marine caves are are a habitat of community interest. Marine caves have had the same role of coralligenous reefs and seagrass beds. In fact, 
cave has such a high level of biological particularities that they are easily susceptible to various threats. Because of their sensitivity, marine caves can be degraded by global pressures, such as global change, and by local pressures, such as coastal engineering interventions. The study of change in biological systems must consider the time factor. Time series are indeed useful for identifying causes in relation to natural dynamics. In our case, they can be used to relate a pressure to an impact. Little is known about caves and their change over time and the response to pressures. The only three marine caves with the time series that allow a study of the dynamics over time are Bergeggi, Palinuro, and Ventimiglia. Bergeggi Cave has been studied since the 1970s when Professor Bianchi, and later we'll have a a photo about him, uh, first detected chemical and physical parameters within the cave. The cave is currently part of a marine protected area of Bergeggi Island. The morphological complexity, as you can see, of Bergeggi Cave, despite being relatively small, is remarkable. The marine cave is subjected to global pressures and local pressures, as I said before. In the case of local pressures, the expansion of the commercial harbor of Vado, Savona, and a series of other coastal interventions added to the current of the Ligurian Sea have led to generate effects on the marine cave. Palinuro's Blue Cave is uh, famous among marine tourism enthusiasts. The cave, which has been studied for a long time, has a characteristic morphology with large holes. Of particular interest is the snow hole where sulfobacteria produce a white substance that flocculates. Local impacts of the Palinuro cave are small. These are mainly seasonal surface tourism, tourism and divers. Ventimiglia, finally, has two caves that have been scientifically unexplored until the construction and the expansion of the Calaforte Harbor. This first scientific survey was carried out in uh, 2020 by Dr. Garibaldi and continued by Professor Montefalcone, the only researcher in the group who has studied the three marine caves in depth. There are two cavities in Ventimiglia and a small cave and a large cave. Both originate from marine erosion phenomena. They have a blind bottom morphology. Local pressures are represented by the close uh, touristic harbor of Ventimiglia, which is why monitoring was requested. For the study of caves over time, it has been of great importance to have a consistent time series. The present study is the first case uh, with this time extension for cave studies. Uh, as you can see in the quotes on the screen, in order to study sea caves, the researcher must enjoy enduring health and long life. 32 years of uh, monitoring and 13 sam sa uh, sampling uh, from 1986 till uh, 2018. The sampling of, three of the three marine caves resulted from different needs and were therefore, as shown, different in number of monitoring and distribution. The synoptic study is intended to be a schematic comparison capable of drawing conclusions despite the heterogeneity of sampling plans. The hypothesis is to assess whether local and global pressures had similar effects on different marine caves. Temporal heterogeneity is contrasted with the uniformity in the study method from the beginning till the last sampling. The method consists of photographic acquisition of photograduates, estimation of the percentage of uh, populations for each photoquadrat, and finally, in silico data processing. Percent cover is estimated according to the, the non-taxonomic descriptor of growth forms, uh, which indicate the structure of the system, i.e. what strategies organisms put in place to find their space in the environment. Computer processing use Euclidean distances and then ecological distances. 
The results of the study are actually quite exciting. The study of ecological distances allowed to generate comparative graphs of the performance of the three marine caves over time. The two graphs show the trend of ecological variability. Here you can see the first one of the three marine caves over time. On the y-axis are the ecological distances, the dissimilarity in, in the indexes, and on the uh, abscisse is the time expressed in years. But in Eurocave, in blue, Bergeg in green, and Ventimiglia in purple, or in red, actually. There are two graphs as the morphofunctional or non-taxonomic descriptors used for the analysis. Right away, both graphs show different patterns for the three caves. But in Euro with higher variability than all of them, given its characteristic broad morphology and diversity of environments. Bergeggi Ventimiglia with similar ecological variability at respective time zero at the beginning of the monitoring plan. Bergeggi cave was divided into two different colors, uh, I mean, two different um, patterns. The first one the, from the first point to the second one and the second pattern from the second one till the last one, the fourth one. Um, this distinction has been defined by the uh, enlargement of the uh, commercial harbor of Vado in uh, Savona. A second aspect to note in both graphs is the remarkable surge of the change for the green line uh, for, for the second uh, part. Uh, from the graph discussed, we could derive the values of the angular coefficients, which are useful for studying the rate of change. Regarding uh, the growth forms, as I said before, it is uh, quite clear to note the closeness of the angular coefficient for Polinuro and uh, Bergeggi. For Bergeggi, after the impact and Ventimiglia, however, the rate of change uh, deviates significantly from the uh, baseline axis. Finally, we can draw some conclusions from the present work. Caves are, have also experienced local pressures as well as global pressures. Caves that also experience, experience local pressures, such as Bergeggi in the second period and Ventimiglia, show a more uh, quick, abrupt, and strong change than those that only experienced global impacts. Global pressures have not some sub substantially changed caves. Caves has, have the capacities to resist to change, yet to be verified whether these have been resilient or resistant to global pressures over time. Net to the diversity of pressures, marine caves have responded similarly to local or global pressures. This is of considerable, considerable importance um, from a management and planning and integrated coastal zone management perspective. Basically, we can say that local pressures have significant impacts on marine caves. Local pressures hammer slowly and steadily on marine cave habitats. And monitoring must continue over time and decision makers must take sustainable actions. So here, I wanted to thank you and thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have time for, for questions. Over there. Thank you very much for your presentation, Paolo Guidetti, Sazione Zoologica, Anton Dorn. Um, so, Mike, I have a question and a comment. The first one is, for sure, we all ask for policymakers and managers to do things properly, uh, sustainably, etc. And then we see that just inside the cave and then in many other habitats, so big ports, harbors, and many other terrible things are realized. So there is no attention to all the things, even though we insist that we have to pay attention. 
Uh, so from a management point of view, we should develop before realizing every single port, harbor, or artificial staff, a plan, a regional plan, saying what we can do is alterating 10%, 20%, we will see which is the agreement, but not so much. Otherwise, any municipality wants a little port. I, so at the end of the story, after 10, 20 years, we have hundreds and hundreds of little ports, and each port will affect everything is around the port. Uh, so there is basically, uh, we don't have a, a development plan. The second one is more focused on, on the caves. Uh, I know uh, both caves of Intimili and Bergeggi, and how do you think it is possible really to separate uh, so the effects of a little port, then more environmental uh, atmospheric events. Because recently I wanted to go inside the Bergeggi cave, but so I did uh, a couple of years ago, it was empty. And recently following a storm, there was a huge amount of sediment. Even so the, the big port of Vado was built uh, many, many years ago. So. Thanks for the difficult question. Um, actually, my opinion, and from my point of view, I, uh, I think a consistent uh, monitoring plan and uh, continuous and maybe more frequent than the one I exposed, but this is up to the local administrations and to the marine protected area managers is the answer to the question. I mean, the, the more we know and the more often we monitor the, the caves and the environment we study, we, we will better know what's going on in, in that area in relation to what's going on. So, for example, for extreme weather phenomena, such as, I don't know, big swells or for engineering interventions on the coastline, we can better relate what we, which is the effect of that intervention or that phenomenon on the cave or on the environment we, we study. Thanks. Thank you. More questions? Okay, then thank you very much. Thanks for Nicolo. Okay, we are going now to move to the next presentation that is dealing with the deep sea. And this is the by Valeria Palumo. And this is the effect of environmental and anthropogenic, anthropogenic factors on the distribution of cold water corals. Hi. Um, okay. I'm Valeria Palumo, and I'm a PhD student. And it's a pleasure to be here today to present my work. Um, so the, um, the, the, the work is, is based on effects of environmental and anthropogenic factors on the distribution uh, of cold water corals. And first of all, as we know, cold water corals represent one of the main important ecosystems in deep sea. These uh, species are uh, classified as hotspots of biodiversity, present a depth range from 50 to over 1,000 meters, are characterized by slow growth rates, rich longevity, slow recoverability after mechanical impacts such as uh, fishing activities. Uh, they also may be used to both solitary or leaf life structures. And in addiction, they play a key ecological role in marine ecosystems. In fact, these species host communities of associated fauna, host a uh, here life stage of many deep sea animals, um, and also uh, species, uh, um, other species of commercial value with different life stage. So due to their sensitivity and uh, uh, ecological importance are classified as vulnerable marine ecosystems and essential fish habitats. So the objective of, the, of this uh, work is to obtain habitat suitability map for six cold water coral species and understand how um, environmental factors and fishing efforts influence the distribution of these species in the steady area. 
we focused on six species belonging to three different orders. We have Scleratinia, represented by Madrepora oculata, Desmophilium pertusum, Dendrophilia cornigera, uh, Antipataria, represented by the black coral Leopates glaberrima, and Alcionacea, represented by Calogorgia verticillata and the bamboo coral Isidella elongata. Regarding the study area is located in the northern part of the Strait of Sicily, presents a, a great body morphological and biological heterogeneity, presents different types of substrates, uh, and all, all of these types were, uh, were observed uh, during ROV, uh, ROV survey. Uh, is subject to high fishing efforts for the presence of uh, species of commercial value, and it is also subject to a high complexity circulation pattern that make it, make it a high productivity, zo productivity zone and a um, biodiversity hotspot. During the survey, 140 trunks were carried out for a total of 129 kilometers. And regarding the survey, two types of multi-beam um, were used, one for shallow water and one for deep water, in order to acquire uh, higher resolution bathymetry data with a resolution of five meters. And from September to November, our ROV survey was carried out for a total of 67 days. And as mentioned before, 140 trunks set, uh, uh, were, uh, were obtained. Uh, the uh, used for this work was a, a tomato a light work class equipped with different important several parts. Um, in the table, it's possible to observe the predictors used for um, this, uh, this study. In particular, we have terrain, oceanographic, and biological variables. And in addiction, fishing variables that express the fishing efforts caused by bottom trawling in the steady area. In order to reduce the correlation between variables, a Pearson coefficient was carried out. And uh, um, between um, and the coupled variables that present a correlation value over than 0.7 were uh, chosen, and one of the variables was removed by the, uh, the models. Regarding the modeling approach, we used maximum entropy. This is an, an important machine learning uh, based on presence only data. It is widely, widely used for species distribution models, in particular for cold water corals. And this approach allowed to obtain model that linked georeferenced observation of the species with, the, um, with different variables such as environmental predictors or fishing efforts as in this case. Regarding the setting, uh, in this table is possible to see the setting used for the models. And uh, in particular, the, the model's validation was determined by um, AUC value. And a value of AUC more than 0 0.7 is considered um, other weight or ideal for the species. And in order to um, uh, evaluate, determine the contribution of each uh, uh, predictors, a uh, jackknife test was, uh, was used and uh, uh, non-significant one variables were, um, were removed by the final models. In the table up on the left, it is possible to observe that for all species considerate, the, the AUC value is more than 0 0.7. So um, the Maxent models uh, were successful in prediction species distribution in the steady area. And regarding each predictors used for uh, the models, uh, for all six species, um, three variables are uh, important. In particular, we have slope. Um, in this case, all species present a positive correlation with this variable. This variable is important because uh, um, uh, in um, expose the, um, the species to high currents, and uh, um, also is uh, um, classified as a limiting factor for fishing activities. And uh, in addiction, slop represents, um, express the steepness of substrates. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this uh, may um, justify because this, this factors is uh, important also for Isidel elongata that as we know, uh, lives only on muddy sediments. Uh, then we have depth. 
um, another important factors for species distribution and all six species present an optimum range of bathymetry. Then we have rugosity. Rugosity um, amplify the terrain complexity. So high value are associated with hard substrates and low value with uh, muddy substrates. And uh, in, the, in, the, in these graphs, it's possible to observe that Isidre longata is the only one species that presents the express the, the, the lower uh, value of, uh, of rugosity, according to the fact, as I mentioned before, that this species lives only on muddy sediments. Other factors uh, are important for some species. In particular, we have chlorophyll A for Madrepora oculata, Calogorgia verticillata, and Isidre longata. And uh, in fact, these three species were observed during ROV survey in the area with the highest concentration of uh, um, primary production. Then we have IS data that express the fishing efforts caused by bottom trawling in the steady area. In this case, for Madrepora pulata, Desmophilium pertusum, and Isidella longata, it's possible to observe a decline of, uh, uh, um, of the probability of the presence of the occurrence of the species uh, when fishing activity increases. Uh, in the case of the Scleratinian, more colonies were observed uprooted uh, from substrates and um, also um, covered by sediments. So this uh, um, maybe these species uh, are indirectly affected by these fishing activities. In the case of Isidella longata, this is uh, uh, the most impacted species by bottom trawling um, because leaves on muddy sediments, but also because uh, leaves in association with different species of commercial value, such as Merluchus merluchus, uh, Aristomorpha foliacea, um, Aristeus antennatus, cow throat uh, uh, trawling. In the case of Leopatas globarima, it's possible to observe a different correlation, maybe because this species uh, lives only and exclusively on hard bottom, so uh, is more impacted by other fishing uh, gears, such as long line than bottom trawling. Uh, in this graph, it's possible to observe the response of um, habitat suitability to uh, currents. And uh, um, this is an important factor because uh, um, provide food supply, um, uh, um, wide pro uh, propagation of, uh, of uh, larvae, and uh, in addiction, uh, reduce the um, the uh, sedimentation rate uh, uh, on uh, on the colonies. Uh, in addiction, as we know, for water corals are uh, sessile suspension feeders, so this variable is more important for the in order to determine the distribution. And in this uh, slide, it's possible to observe habitat suitability maps obtained for all six species. In the case of Madrepora oculata, Leiopatas glaberima, and Calogorgia verticillata, it's possible to observe um, patches, georeferenced patches in the steady area. In the case of Desmophilium pertusum and Endrophilia colinigera, presents a, a more uh, random distribution. Uh, and Isile longata is the only one that presents a habitat suitable extended uh, through the entire study area with the higher uh, probability in the southeast part confirmed by um, the real observation uh, obtained during uh, ROV survey. So in conclusion, we uh, can say that uh, um, cold water corals uh, represent vulnerable marine ecosystems and essential fish habitats, so their, um, their mapping is an important step for uh, for their protection. In this work, in particular, slope, depth, and rugosity are among the factors that influence uh, the habitat preference of all six species considered. Fishing efforts seems to be a relevant factor for four species, and in particular, three of these species of these species are classified as critically endangered by UCN, and one uh, is endangered. So they study their distribution is a, a, an essential step. Knowing the current distribution of living cold water corals serves as a starting point for future research. 
uh, such as uh, uh, the response uh, to climate change of these species in, term of, in terms of occurrence and distribution. And in fine, habitat mapping, um, the integration of uh, habitat suitability models, uh, um, fishing efforts data, and uh, high um, resolution environmental variables represents an essential tool um, in order to creating successful management plans, in particular in the area where um, data of these species are not available. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, we have time maybe for one, maybe two questions. Yeah, there. Hi. Uh, did you notice any overlap between white corals and black corals? I mean, the effort in the distribution and second, or maybe I didn't get it. Um, this is how we choose the transect carbon. You can find the data with distribution so that you can choose the substrate, how the rock substrate are interested by the currents. Okay. So, uh, regarding the first, qu the first question, uh, uh, black, um, black cora were observed uh, mainly in the uh, in the northwest part, where uh, um, an area characterized uh, exclusively by hard bottom, and uh, uh, the white coral uh, were observed, the Madrepora curata and Esmophilium pertusum were observed in the south part of the area, uh, on uh, both on hard bottom, but also on uh, um, concretion uh, of thanatogenosis. And uh, um, as, a, a, as I uh, mentioned during the presentation, more colonies were observed uh, uprooted on, uh, from the sediments. And regarding the second question, the, um, this survey was, uh, uh, was, um, was uh, um, carried out for um, another important project uh, aimed to uh, the construction of an offshore wind farm. So uh, the trunk set uh, um, were located in the area, uh, in, in the most important area um, for uh, the researcher um, in base on the uh, multi-beam data. So uh, we, is a, a, a um, and no. Um, is an equilibrate uh, uh, survey in uh, so on both on hard bottom and flat bo and uh, muddy bottom. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you. I think what we are going to move. We have more questions. I think that we can keep it for the discussion later. Let's move then for the for the final presentation of this session. That is with Michela Angiolillo, and is the monitoring Italian circulatory and upper batial bio biogenic reefs within the implementation of the European Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm going to present the Italian approach to monitor the circa littoral and upper, upper batial uh, biogenic reef within the marine strategy framework uh, directive and the prim uh, primary results uh, of the first cycle of the activities. The MSFD is, uh, was uh, adopted by, by um, uh, European member states to protect and manage the marine uh, environment through an holistic uh, um, ecological approach in a holistic uh, way. Um, it was uh, uh, aimed to uh, achieve the uh, good and maintain a good environmental uh, status 
uh, by base, uh, using adopting adopting adequate measure based on the um, uh, the implement of uh, um, standardized uh, uh, protocol and the ecological indicators uh, given the importance of uh, biogenic uh, reef um, Italy, uh, the Italy decided to uh, adopt um, monitoring of uh, this uh, of benthic, uh, this benthic uh, ecosystem uh, in uh, the monitor programs of, of uh, marine uh, strategy. So, as um, the upper circular biogenic reef, uh, so the coral regional reef, are monitored by the regional agency. Uh, as uh, told us uh, yesterday, Martina. Uh, whereas uh, the deeper uh, biogenic reef, namely the offshore rocky habitats and cold water corals, are monitored by ISPRA in collaboration with the University of uh, Genova. Um, uh, among the 11 uh, descriptors uh, used to implement the directive, uh, the descriptor 1, biological diversity, and the descriptor 10, marine litter, was used to characterize the uh, environmental status of this benthic uh, habitat. Several criteria are associated to both uh, um, descriptor and uh, uh, make the use of uh, uh, relative uh, indicators such as uh, abundance, density, uh, diversity, uh, size, uh, structure, distribution, and so on, uh, with the aim to the assess the, uh, the environmental status of the benthic habitat. Uh, the Italian monitoring activity uh, are carried out by the means of the research vessel Astrea by the use of a multi-beam and an ROV uh, in order to explore and monitoring the deep, for, deep coral forest and in particular the sclerotinian cold water reef following a standardized protocol, protocol with the aim to uh, characterize the um, diversity, uh, abundance, uh, um, size structure of the target uh, species and the impact of marine uh, litter and, for example, the entanglement. Um, up to now, uh, five uh, research um, campaign uh, was uh, carried out uh, between uh, one to 500 meters depth, mainly in the um, uh, Western Mediterranean subregion and in the Ionian Central Mediterranean subregion. In particular, we explored the area of Siracusa and Linosa in the uh, Ion, uh, Central Mediterranean in the, uh, Sicily and the Pontine archipelago for uh, explore the deep coral forest, uh, whereas explore the Corsical Channel and the Canyon Dorn for study the Scleratinia uh, cold water coral reef, namely the Madre Paracolata and Loferia Pertusa ecosystem. And uh, we uh, choose this area base, based on uh, data available on uh, literature in order to uh, uh, select seat, uh, sites that can be uh, to be uh, monitored in the future, because this is the first uh, cycle uh, beginning 2020. And uh, every three years, we can uh, repeat the um, dives in the same location in order to acquire data that can be uh, comparable in the future. The area of Siracusa is characterized by uh, uh, rich assemblages of uh, Dendrophilia ramea uh, with the co-occurrence of uh, Corallium uh, rubrum uh, colonies on uh, rock on uh, boulders scattered on uh, the detritic uh, uh, substrate a lot of uh, colonies were recorded very few are, um, the major part are of these small sites but there is uh, some several uh, colony uh, higher than uh, 40 centimeters 
uh, a lot of fishing line were recorded in the area and uh, uh, entangled, in particular, the largest colonies, as we all know. <laughs> Um, in Linosa, we uh, carried out uh, six dives, uh, revising the site explored before by Romagnoli et al. in 2020. Uh, the upper layer where um, uh, very rich assemblage is made of lush colony of Nicella Cavolini, Paramice Calavata, Antipella, Antipatella Subvinata sub, sub was uh, recorded. In the deeper layer, instead, uh, the benthic communities is dominated by black coral, small gorgonians, and uh, some uh, litistid uh, sponges. Uh, the analysis of this, this data uh, are in progress, and the aim is to uh, apply the MAX index in order to have a baseline um, of the status of these uh, assemblages in order to uh, the in the next cycle to repeat the, the monitoring and can compare the data and, and give a real uh, evaluation of the, stat the, the status of the, the habitat. Uh, in the Pontine, Pontine Archipelago, in the middle of the Tyrrhenian Sea, we explore other uh, four areas, the, almost the, all the islands, and uh, we revised the site explored by University of Genova with the project uh, Eco Safimed, with the same aim to compare the data. And also, we uh, conduct, uh, carried out uh, eight new explored. Uh, site uh, to uh, select the better site to where carried out the monitoring. And um, this archipelago is uh, characterized in particular by important forests of Parantipatex larix. Also in this case, there is a lot of uh, fishing net, marine litter, and uh, a lot of uh, structuring species are uh, affected by entanglement. Also in this case, the max index will be applied in order to assess and compare the data set, in particular with the, the, uh, uh, the data uh, used by Genova previously in 2014. Uh, regarding the Scleratinian cold water corals, uh, explore the Canyon Dorn. Uh, we revised the site explored before by Taviani and then explore the area in the middle of the canyon. Uh, all the sites are characterized by presence of uh, mixed up assemblages of Madrepura culata and uh, Lofelia pertusa, characterized by dense population and uh, small uh, colonies. Uh, in particular, this, uh, the pinnacle on the center, in the center of the canyon is uh, characterized by lush uh, population. Uh, litter is a, a constant uh, is a present also in this area, in particular this uh, very near to in the, to the important uh, city uh, with the historical data on fishing. Uh, several colonies of Madre Peraculata, for, for example, observed growing on, uh, also on uh, the line, but uh, a lot of entanglement event was uh, also uh, recorded. And uh, the last uh, area uh, analyzed was the um, uh, Corsica Channel, uh, also before uh, studied by Angeletti et al. Also in this case, a new uh, explored uh, new seat, uh, site uh, was uh, explored. And uh, also in this case, all the uh, uh, explored area are characterized by uh, lush uh, colonies of the Madre Puraculata and some of the Lofelia Pertusa. Uh, also in this area, there is uh, a lot of other stru uh, structuring uh, species such as uh, um, uh, largest colonies of uh, Leopates, Glaberrima, for example. Uh, we record uh, also on mud substrate uh, the um, Isidella elongata. And um, 
so, so a lot of other uh, uh, charismatic species are present in the zone. Uh, concluding, the, all the data collect, supply a preliminary baseline assessment of the ecological status of the circulatoral uh, forest and sclerotinia cold water coral ecosystem. Uh, this approach enlarges the previous knowledge about an investigated area and proposes specific, specific site to be monitored in the, in the future monitor cycle within the MSFD, and then will be used as a reference point. Different health ass uh, assessments were obtained by the survey day sites uh, from almost uh, pristine to strongly impacted by uh, fisher related items. And, um, but overall, the area results uh, in good environmental status. In general, no ex ex extensive habitat destruction was uh, observed, observed training the environment. However, when we analyze the data, in particular uh, the, um, uh, to assess the status of uh, sclerotinia and cold water corals, we realized that it's important to develop a multiparametric multi ecological index, integrating both index of status and uh, pressures such as can, uh, that will can we use in the shallow reefs uh, to obtain uh, reliable, coherent, uh, and comparable data for uh, future monitoring yeah. activities? Uh, this monitor activity, moreover, will be pivotal to implement specific uh, protection measures for these uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. <laughs> Any question? Oh, everything clear? Okay. Okay. Then thank you. To, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now we have because it's going very late. And people is very tired. I think that we will have something like five minutes to for for the discussions. If you have something that you want to say about this last session or maybe before, anything. Yeah, Maya. Or, Uh, just a small comment. I think that with the, the presentation of Michaela, it's also important to keep in mind uh, these uh, directives, even if it's not our job, but uh, going to explore so deep is so costly that uh, we also at least have to keep these, um, um, I think, uh, directives that have uh, what what is asked from Europe and also from the Barcelona Convention um, in mind in order to try and bring elements to answer um, just that. Yeah, and maybe something that I would like to add with this kind of uh, works and expeditions is like uh, as they are so expensive because we are working in very deep areas and with a lot of uh, equipment, very expensive equipment. Sometimes what is missing is a much better collaboration among scientists because there are some expeditions that are only for geology, some others that are only for biology, others only for impacts, only for plastics. And I think that we are missing a lot of you know, I, we are losing a lot of time and we are spending a lot of money, not maybe in the in the best way. And if this is something that obviously in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, we will have to do this kind of researches 
to know the, the status of many of these habitats that are so expensive to, to study. I think that it would be good to, to have a better collaboration. As we have said with, with Coraliginus, but I think for deep sea habitats and for uh, caves that also need a specific tools, as we were saying about using ROVs. <laughs> ROVs is something that we will need to create an, a specific ROV for caves, because if not, the, the ROV is going to destroy everything when entering into the caves. Then we need a lot of investment and we need a lot of support for doing many of these uh, researches. And we need a lot of collaborations and, and to put the different scientific uh, teams working together and take the, the, the most of these advantages over there. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, thank you, Ricardo, for this comment. This is why I was a bit hesitating when I put uh, forward uh, these uh, suggestions. But uh, my idea is that, uh, okay, uh, we are not only supposed to use the tools that are available, but also to help create new tools. I mean, uh, if uh, new tools were developed with this kind of exploration in mind, uh, then we could uh, develop methods to, to be, for an ROV, let's say, to be able to penetrate a cave without creating any uh, any damage, let's say with sensors that uh, calculate the distance and uh, uh, perform some auto uh, auto calibrating uh, all the time. Uh, but um, in order to, to to develop such techniques, uh, the, the we should have uh, motivation and probably uh, <laughs> money. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, maybe a good suggestion for, for AXPA, we have been discussing with some colleagues uh, about uh, the possibility to organize uh, a workshop or, or I think a series of workshops. One should be uh, about the, um, the study of, of marine caves and maybe dark habitats in general. Uh, specifically for marine caves, there was some discussion before about, you know, the, the, the most suitable sampling technique or sampling surfaces. And the truth is that we don't really know. And we need uh, also intercalibration for indices like KVBQI. You have been discussing with some people during the, uh, during the break about, about this, uh, this possibility. So I think we definitely need a workshop about methodologies for studying these dark habitats in general and specifically uh, about caves. Because uh, and we can take examples from the Coraliginus uh, from the methodologies used for in the Coraliginus um, habitats, so it could be a more general workshop even for different habitats to take examples from 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 other cases. And the other thing that I would like to point out is that we also need um, training courses for taxonomy. I was very happy to see uh, during this uh, session. Okay, some some of the papers are uh, of the uh, communications where communications where I participate. But there were many new species also from the deep waters and unfortunately taxonomy is dying, not only in the Mediterranean Sea globally and also in Europe. And at some point we will not be able to identify all the species. So we need two series of workshops, one for methodologies and one for taxonomy of uh, specifically for sessile invertebrates. And I think that uh, RAXPA could possibly help us to, to organize uh, uh, a series of workshops about these topics. Thank you very much. It's the area of the comments here. <laughs> um, talking about collaboration, I was looking if Leonardo was here, but uh, I think we could underline the work that has been done with Ramoj uh, Explorations. Now it's the third uh, exploration that happened uh, this year in deep sea in the area between uh, Liguria, Italy, Monaco, and uh, part of France, the PACA region, um, where the work is done together with the same material uh, to explore. Now the methods and techniques and reasons of exploration are not necessarily the same in the three countries, but at least there's a mutualization of the energy and um, the means. And I, uh, from my knowledge, it's the only one uh, that um, that's international uh, like that, and that continues. I hope we'll continue more uh, there. Just 
Yeah, I think that uh, just to finish, I think that we have to be wise also with the, ah, there is a, another, okay. Okay, thank you. Not just because uh, regarding the consideration done by, by Maya, in fact, as, uh, with this uh, small international agreement, Ramos, uh, involving France, Monaco in Italy, from the, the 2015, we are starting with a series of uh, we are now the last week we term, uh, we handed the third uh, uh, oceanographic campaign and the objective of this campaign is collect data uh, in particular on dark habitat canyons and seamounts uh, to define common way to collect data uh, homogeneous data consistent data and uh, also for the protection common way to protect these environments but also to define common way to um, evaluate the health status of the species, the indices. And in fact, we are also in contact with the colleagues of, in Fran of France in particular to develop this asset. And I think that this could be a pilot uh, example that should be uh, useful for um, all the Mediterranean community on, the, on this topic. And then we are available for uh, share all uh, our information and in particular also to um, uh, as suggested by Vasilis for, for uh, CAPES, start to, uh, because in fact, uh, these initiatives is just, uh, is, is a, in a, uh, in a, as a targeted to define some common uh, solution useful for the implementation of the high map uh, process and the, uh, the ECAP. And then uh, just to inform that we are available for this and to share information and possible example and experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonardo. Yeah, and just to finish, what I wanted to say is, is to be wise in the way that we are going to work in from now on, because we are doing this research or this expedition for accomplishing with the Barcelona Convention and the protocols. Then we are doing another expedition to accomplish with Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and then we have to start to wise a little bit wider because now we have knocking the door also the, the natural law of restoration. And it would be good also to have in mind when we are doing this kind of research that not only for one specific law or for accomplishing with, with one specific agreement, but trying to, to, to get as much information as possible also to apply the, 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 new, the new rules that we are going to have. And for example, for the natural uh, law or for the restoration in general, it would be very interesting to know the places that could be naturally restored if you leave them alone, because maybe they have uh, corals in the past or because they have coralligenous in the past. And it would be interesting to, to include all these things in our brain when we are preparing a, an expedition or when we are preparing a research. I think that, thank you very much to all of you for, for attending this, this symposium. Okay, we break here and we start tomorrow at 8.30. We still uh, have uh, one session uh, with three uh, uh, oral presentation and the poster session. So for those who will present tomorrow the poster, please send me uh, your uh, presentation or the PDF at this address just to ease my life and uh, avoid me to spend the the night sending you a reminder, please. Okay.